for the city county city council meeting wednesday october 13th oh God, do 2021 uh, 8 30 a.m city hall at this time we'll uh, do the invocation and the pledge and we'll ask mrs barnaby if she can do the um, invocation oh, did he show up here. okay yes, he's here. the pastor is here so right. pastor paul dr paul mclaughlin assistant pastor with bible baptist church come forward thank you I wasn't sure if I was late or early. <laughs> traffic around here, it's the kind Lord's of difficult. Timing is perfect. Oh, yeah. Sorry uh, to get us on the track. <laughs> uh, very thankful. Yeah, I'd like to read you something, if I might, before I pray. Something I was reading this morning in my devotions that was greatly encouraging. Out of Psalm uh, chapter 111. It says, Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, sought all of them that have pleasure therein. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endureth forever. He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we gather today at this meeting, we ask that you will be in our midst. Help us to make decisions that will be pleasing to you and beneficial to those who will be directly impacted by those decisions. Help us to be able to discuss the matters at hand in a reasonable way and to be willing to give up having our own way. Dear God, let this meeting be productive and as should be the case in all areas of our lives, help us to keep you at the forefront of our minds in spite of the influences that surround us on a daily basis. We give thanks to you for those that are here today, ordained by your will and leadership and every concerned citizen of Manatee County. As we do the work set before us today, Lord, we pray for your presence, wisdom, and favor. I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Please join us in the pledge. I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to, to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Call the meeting to order. Mrs. Melton. We have a proclamation this morning that I'll read on behalf of the mayor. By virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Bradenton, I do hereby issue this proclamation honoring Bradenton Marauders a Ball League Champion Celebration Day, October 13th, 2021. Whereas in 2021, the Bradenton Marauders secured their rightful place as winners of the A Southeast League Championship. And whereas Marauders have established career, career history of being great athletes and team players, they were victorious in the 2016 Florida State League Championship and the 2014 Florida State League All-Star Game. And whereas the team is an, an, is an outstanding role model for our community's younger generations by accomplishing hundreds of hours of volunteerism. Their commitment to our friendly city proves they are winners on and off the baseball field. And whereas Bradenton is known for a long-standing tradition of great baseball with a beautiful historic homestead providing an up-close and personal, personal, per, excuse me, personal baseball experience. And whereas the Marauders are an affiliate of the Pittsburgh Pirates and an integral part of the incredible baseball tradition in Bradenton, and whereas our city is fortunate as our Marauders are committed to playing baseball in Bradenton and providing fun, a fun atmosphere for families to enjoy. Now therefore be it resolved that I, Jean Brown, as mayor of the city of Bradenton, Florida, do hereby proclaim October 13, 2021, as Bradenton Marauders Celebration Day and urge all citizens to support, support and congratulate our home team. Go Marauders! Signed, Gene Brown Mayor. Craig, you wanna say some words? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Appreciate it. We really appreciate being here and um, uh, proud to call City of Bradenton home. So we'll keep it going and thanks for all the support. Um, really appreciate it, so thank you. Anybody? I was just going to say that yeah. obviously we uh, congratulate you and we, we appreciate the relationship with the, the parent company of the Pittsburgh Pirates and what they've done for our city for, for decades and, and hopefully decades to come. And, 
And like I said, even that, that night at the celebration, that the partnership is great for the city long before all of us and, and now through us here. And, and uh, we look forward to it that the Pirates are part of our city, not just taken from our city. So we appreciate that, and, and we appreciate all the, uh, the excitement that the Marauders brought, and we look forward to another one next year. All right. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Have a great day. Right. Appreciate well it. Well done. All right. Any um, presentations? We don't have any. Um, I don't know, and I know, um, see somebody in the audience here. I don't see them right now, but we'll come back to that. All right. Um, going to citizen comment. Citizen comment will be accepted at this time on any non-agenda items. Comments will be accepted on the public hearings and agenda items at the appropriate time. And um, I have a couple of cards. One of them is Ron Tompkins. Um, you'll have three minutes. Um, please state your name and address for the record, and you'll have three minutes. Uh, my name is Ron Tompkins. I'm a citizen resident of the city of Bradenton. Um, I came here today to follow up on uh, Councilman Sanders' uh, suggestion of a COVID discussion agenda item for the city. Uh, currently, COVID is probably the number one most important topic of our day. It's one that it's a touchy subject, to say the least, to anybody. Uh, this is something that we should talk about, we should be open about, and we should all fully appreciate the scope and the, the importance of this discussion. Today, I bring to you uh, U.S. Patent U.S. 20210082583881. This is an open source document. This is available at the U.S. Patent Office. This document will prove the malfeasance of the federal government and every agency in the federal government that is either indirectly or directly involved with the COVID pandemic response in the continental United States and globally. The mayor and the council have an obligation and a responsibility to yourselves, your family, and to the citizens and the community of the city of Bradenton to address these items in an open forum. There's only been one council member, Mr. Roth, that openly stated that he's vaccinated. This patent affects every vaccinated and unvaccinated citizen on planet Earth. This patent is the culmination of decades of nanotech biotechnology that whether some people have done their research or not done their research, this patent was applied for in June of 2020. <coughs> this patent, this technology, this transhuman technology is in every single vaccine produced to date. You, if you've been vaccinated, have been chipped by the government. This is malfeasance on a worldwide scale. This sounds like a conspiracy theory. And I sound like a lunatic standing up here talking to you today. But I assure you, this is no theory. This is genuine. This is real. This is a patent that every single one of you can look up. And this is the smoking gun of the COVID-19 narrative. And you should take the time to read these 50 pages. These thank, 50 thank pages you. prove thank you. that you have been technologically chipped. All right, thank you. We're gonna, three minutes is up. Thank okay. you. We're moving on to uh, next citizen comment. Sarah Hood, please come forward. Hello, my name is Sarah Hood. 
Um, I just moved here from Arkansas with my little family back here. We purchased a home on 22nd Street Court Northeast right next door to a man named Jeff Peters. And I'm here to discuss that today. Um, there are a lot of details to this issue, so I'm going to try really fast to just read through and so that I don't miss anything. But the gist of the story is that we've been in communication with the city for months <laughs> to resolve an issue about neighborhood flooding that derived from alterations made to Jeff Peters' property. The issue has affected at least 10 homes that I know of, maybe even more, but it affects my home the worst. The issue has tanked our property value, and I don't really know what else we're supposed to do at this particular moment. I know that there are other neighbors that are trying to sell their homes as a result of Mr. Peter's mistake, and I'm hoping that this situation is not reflective of Bradenton as a whole. Definitely wasn't like this in Arkansas. Um, I spoke with the Public Works Department not that long ago about what was happening with the property and I was told that a new drainage pipe was being placed that would resolve the issue and I saw that pipe get installed. So my husband and I thought that the issue was resolved. Um, we've had some really pr pretty crazy interactions with Mr. Jeff Peters and we just wanted to sell our home and get away from him. Um, but we had to wait until that issue was resolved to do that. So I saw that the pipe was put in and we listed our house for sale and we went, to, we were set to close actually tomorrow. But this past Sunday, Jeff Peters actually intercepted our buyer and pretty much talked them out of buying our house because there was a major flooding issue. He ultimately lost us the, the contract. And I'm just really curious as to why he would do that if the issue is indeed resolved. He is the source of our problem and he is responsible for fixing it. And to the best of my knowledge, the problem should have been resolved because the city had worked with the engineer um, and the work had just been completed. But honestly, we really feel attacked by Mr. Peters. Um, so I'm here first off to get help with that situation for not only myself, but my many neighbors that are struggling with this too. But secondly, I would like to know why city councilman Bill, Bill Sanders called me to strongly discourage me from seeking an attorney on this. I would also like to know why, according to him, I would not win in court if I did. I would also like to know why and what his resolution is to our problem as we are now months into this with a dangerous seemingly man with no resolve in sight. I'm also curious as to why Jeff was permitted to do these alterations to begin with. And according to Mr. Sanders, his direct quote was, he knows Jeff personally and he knows what Jeff did. And Jeff knows what Jeff did. And what Jeff did was build up his property too high. And that in turn affected Okay, thank you. Time is up. Um, okay. There's think, way more. But. I know. It's something that probably, if you've got something written down, you can give to Mrs. Melton and I she do. can put in the I record. Do. I have quite a and bit And then it's something that definitely, our public works director is not here today. He's out of town. But, but I'll have our administrator and um, public works director get with you and go over some issues on that. So. Thank and you. Mayor, we're, yeah. for Mrs. Hood's benefit, we're interested in any alterations, and there have been some uh, directives put to Mr. Hood that you kind of alluded to. Um, regarding compliance with drainage requirements and other things. And so we're going to keep a close eye on uh, the engineering um, completion of the, the, the flood control and the impact on other neighbors and the like. So I will, I will absolutely personally engage with this and get back with you. I appreciate what you said. I, I absolutely appreciate what you Is said. Is there a way to get, like, something in writing? Well, they'll, he'll get with you, so yeah. we've got to move thank on you. now. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks for coming thank down. you. Get with her. Yep, just give her the information. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Mr. Perry at this time before we go to consent agenda just to kind of uh, introduce somebody that's in the audience. It won't be till a CRA meeting, but they wanted to come this morning and that for something that's going to happen with, with yeah. everyone. Yep. Sure. Mayor, just briefly, uh, th this is regarding the Mini uh, Rogers property and, and uh, development of that CRA property. And uh, if you'd come forward. Peters, I'd, I'd met with, um, is the developer with the proposal for that property. And obviously, we were aware of the interest in trying to get a, um, a grocer for that particular neighborhood and development for the benefit of the neighborhood, the community, and the like. And it's been an ongoing project for a long time. I think that Peter's put together a viable proposal. Uh, Peter has bought some of the principals from that grocer into town who's done a lot of diligence and legwork and demographic study 
of the suitability um, of that particular location for this for this commercial purpose. And I think it shows great interest um, by those individuals and earnest uh, in, in coming to Bradenton and, and, and sitting with the principals. They're going to be at the CRA meeting, I believe, later on today. But I did want to just give uh, Peter the opportunity to just say hello and uh, give a couple quick comments. Well, thank you very much. I've met many of you a number of times, and we have with us today, I'm sorry, they're probably parking right now, um, Edwin... Uh, <laughs> and, and I apologize for that. Uh, Edwin yeah. Polanco and um, Raphael, uh, who are the two operators of Ideal Food. So since I, they're not quite here, I'll just hand these to you for you to see at a different, we'll talk about it at the CRA meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. <coughs> Edwin, Ed, excuse me, Edwin and Raphael may walk in and, and at least, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No, Did I walk right by you? Huh, sorry. <laughs> I started with Pam. Excuse me, Bob. Yeah. So, um, so this, these are not all their stores. This is, I don't know, 15 or, or so of them. And, uh, and they have Ideal Foods is a 50-store chain. And uh, Edwin and uh, Raphael own... Uh, 19 of those stores, um, maybe this is number 20. I'm, I may be a little off on the count, maybe this is 21 that we'll be building for them, hopefully uh, next year if we get our permits and entitlements. But uh, they're here in town today uh, and they brought their wives and uh, they've spent time in uh, the market to you know, reassure themselves that there is the food dollars here that they expect. They're a specialty food market. The store will be 20,000, 25,000 square foot actually. 5,000 on the second floor for storage. Uh, they operate a terrific specialty store, fresh fruits, produce, um, great meat selections, and uh, I think you'll find this is a strong candidate that'll do a great job in this uh, market service area. Uh, they can attend to both the, uh, the, the shopper that's within the half mile walking distance and also the shopper that goes all the way down to the river or either side of, d of downtown, which is really, of course, you realize they need two hundred fifty to $300,000 a week, so they need to pull from a broader um, range of customers. And we hope that'll do it. And I know Mr. Mayor, I spoke with him uh, the other day uh, talking about the kinds of transportations and the, some of the bus companies could probably help us with to allow that circulation of people to get to our location as well as to the other housing developments that are close by. And um, we're hoping through the CRA later on today we can, you know, explore that uh, a little further. Well, good. Thank you, Peter. And I know we met yesterday and it's important and I think it shows up here. And the reason I wanted you to talk in our meeting here was because it does show how this council really is trying to help and, and solve and get that um, grocery store in that neighborhood that's been needed for a long time. So we appreciate it and good luck in the CRA today. Thank you very much, we'll see you later. Thank you. All right, moving on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion? <laughs> motion for the move, consent. Move to approve the consent agenda. All right, we have a motion by Mr. Roth. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Barnaby. Any further discussion? We'll start the vote in Ward 4. Yes. Five. Yes. One. Yes. Two. Yes. Three. Yes. Consent agenda carries five to zero. Moving on. Mrs. Melton. We have the second reading and public hearing for ordinance 3088, an ordinance of the city of Bradenton, Florida, amending part one, charter and related laws, subpart B, related laws, article three, firefighters retirement system of the code of ordinances of the city of Bradenton, Florida, Amending Section 8, Disability, Providing for Codification, Providing for Severability of Provisions, Repealing All Ordinances in Conflict Herewith, and Providing an Effective Date. All right, and we, this is our second reading, so we, um, do we have any? Attorney Christensen. Christensen is here, so is there any questions from him, or I just want to open the public, let's just open the public hearing. Open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak? Anyone wishing to speak? Anyone wishing to speak? Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing. 
Chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Um, I would uh, move to approve ordinance 3088 uh, dealing with the firefighters uh, pension with the request as brought forward. Second. Second by Mrs. Coachman. All right, any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll start the vote. Ward five? Yes. One? Yes. Two? Yes. Three? Yes. Four? Yes. Thank you. Carries five to zero. I guess uh, next is uh, Attorney Rudisell. Could you want to read it, Mrs. Melton? Thank you. This is the first reading of Ordinance 3089, an ordinance of the City of Bradenton, Florida, extending the temporary moratorium on the offering for hire of motorized scooters or micro mobility devices, or issuance of any authorizations, permits, or franchises pertaining to micro mobility adopted pursuant to ordinance 3055 and ex extended pursuant to ordinance 3062, ordinance 3074, and ordinance 3077, and providing that said moratorium shall remain in effect until May 14th, 2022, or shall terminate on the effective date of the city's adoption of an ordinance to regulate motorized scooters or micro mobility devices. Thank you, Mr. Rudisell. Yeah, good morning. Uh, this is just an extension of the um, micromobility uh, device moratorium. Um, we do have a draft ordinance that we're, we're planning to bring forward shortly, so we don't expect to utilize the full, uh, the full time frame for this moratorium, but uh, this is just to keep the moratorium in place until we can bring the ordinance forward. Good, thank you. So do we, we need a vote on this today or Not just today. move it forward? Not today. No action today. No action today. All right, and that's, I think, the goal of this council is to do it sooner than later, but we just had to extend it to get to the point. And I know that the, the committee is working on it and we had a great presentation. That's correct. And Mr. Rudisell, Mayor, Mr. Mayor, Council, Mr. Rudisell and I had a pretty lengthy conversation about the best approach and the, the duration of this extension. Um, it would obviously involve uh, modification to our ordinance, the time associated with that, the potential for an RFP, uh, trying to develop the contours of the permissible zone through the contract with the the um, the winner of the RFP the, the vendor and the like and so there's a fairly lengthy body of work that needs to be done hence the six months we're hopeful we don't need that amount of time we are recognized um, and cognizant of, of trying to get this done for spring training and, and other events that were spoken about at the last council meeting but uh, we are where we where we are and, and need an extension okay thank you all right, Mrs. Melton, if we want to administer the oath. Yes, anyone wishing to address City Council during the following public hearings will please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the factual statements and representations which you are about to present to this board will be truthful and accurate? Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Melton. Ordinance 3085, this is the second reading and public hearing. An ordinance of the city of Bradenton, Florida vacating a portion of 3rd Street, 5th Street, and Jackson Street as shown on the plat of South Braden Castle Camp addition to Manatee FLA, recorded in plat book two, page 144 of the public records of Manatee County, Florida, being located generally east of 27th Street East and south of 11th Avenue East providing for recordation in the official records, providing for severability, and providing for an effective date. All right, thank you. Myra. Good morning, Council. Myra Schwartz, um, Development Services and Zoning Manager. Um, today to present to you a very brief um, presentation, uh, request for a vacation of right-of-way, Ordinance 3085, case number RV212539. The applicant is Adam Jacobson of JBHFFLLC, agent for owner, Golf Village Incorporated. The request is to vacate three described portions of right-of-way that are associated with a preliminary subdivision plat request, SP212424. Um, he's requesting to uh, vacate three sections on uh, the property here at um, that's bounded by 27th Street, 11th Avenue, and 30th Street Court East. Um, approval was uh, August 18th for the subdivision plat, contingent upon approval of this uh, right-of-way vacation request. Um, the, uh, we have the sketch and descriptions of the three separate portions, and you can see an old plat. The reason uh, that these are 
laying out there is because they have never been developed. They are not currently in use by the city. They're not currently in use by any other um, utility agency. And they will be part of the uh, overall subdivision area. Um, staff recommends approval of this requested vacation of right-of-way with no stipulation. Staff has found that the public utilities that may utilize this right-of-way have agreed with its vacation. The right-of-way is currently configured, doesn't serve the city's needs for circulation, and is no longer needed for public services. Redevelopment of the site will result in the creation of new public access ways which better connect the surrounding community and establish a direct connection between 27th Avenue West and 30th Street Court East and to the River Run development via an extension of River Run Way. Planning Commission met in public hearing on August 18th, 2021 and voted unanimously to approve RV 21-2539. And you all heard the first reading um, with a very brief presentation at that time on September 22nd. Uh, today is your final uh, decision. Okay, thank you. Any okay. questions before we go to the public hearing? <clears throat> Hearing none, we'll open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak? Anyone wishing to speak? Anyone wishing to speak? Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing. Chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. Move to approve ordinance 3085 as presented today. All right. second. second, Mr. Roth, appreciate it. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll start the vote in Ward 1. Yes. 2. Yes. 3. Yes. 4. Yes. 5. Yes. Thank you. It carries unanimously. All right, moving forward. Mrs. Melton. This is MA21.2766 public hearing. Request by Tim Ridner of Cedarwood Development for Southern Hospitality Associates, LLC, Bradenton Land Company 2, LLC, and Bradenton Land Company, LLC, for a major PDP amendment to increase the number of multi-family dwelling units from 584 to 696 units in the PDP zoning district. The property is located at 5055 3rd Avenue East, Bradenton, Florida. Parcel ID numbers are 1121 0000001, and 11231070059. Great job. <laughs> Reading those. All right, Myra. Myra Schwartz, one more time. Actually, one of a few. Um, as Tamara said, this is a request for a major PDP amendment to increase the number of multifamily dwelling units from 584 to 696. This is um, for the Blue Heron, uh, formerly known as the Magnolia Lakes um, apartment development. It's been around for a number of years. Phase one and two have been developed. Um, you can see the location here off of 48th Street Court East and north of State Road 64 East, uh, Phase 1, Phase 2. And the purpose of this is to develop Phase 3 with um, 112 more units uh, total for the development than was originally proposed. Um, <clears throat> they are in residential low future land use. The request is compliant with the Comprehensive Plan Future Land Use Element Policy 1.2.1. The future land use category low density residential carries a base density of six units per acre at uh, about 117 um, acres more or less. The property may possess up to 705 total units um, by, uh, by future land use category. Zoning um, has maintained its status as a PDP over the years because it has been developed um, in process of development for a long time. Um, you can see the two phases here already available in aerials. Phase one, Blue Heron Creek. Phase two, Blue Heron Lake. Phase three, uh, future development. Um, <clears throat> the applicant is requesting to amend a residential plan development project to increase the number of dwelling units total for the entire project, all three phases, from 100 and, I'm sorry, 584 multifamily units to a total of 696 multifamily units for an overall increase of 112 units. PDP is three-phase multifamily, um, originally approved as PR 050020 on June 16, 2006. 
Phase one was approved as MB, a minor amendment 130081, and consists of 264 units and was completed in 2016. Phase two uh, approved as MB, again a minor amendment, 165165, consists of 192 units, <coughs> completed in 2020. The uh, increase in the total units would allow phase three to possess 240 total uh, uh, multifamily units. Major PDP amendment is required because um, the amendment is in conflict with any stipulation of original approval or commitment made by the applicant during the public hearing process for the original approval. So while the project does have an entitlement for well over um, the 584 by the future land use uh, and the comp plan category, um, they were approved by city council for a set number of units. And so they have to come back to you for any approval of anything more. Um, the subsequent amendments, uh, <coughs> excuse me, for the 264 units phase one, 192 units in phase two, specifically limited residential density to the overall total that was originally approved by the PDP. So they do, again, have to come back um, to you to change that approved density. This is a uh, uh, proposed site plan for the future development. You can see phase one completed down here, phase two uh, completed up here, and the uh, driveways, which um, are, will continue on to phase three. Substantial wetland area here, <coughs> excuse me, that will be preserved, and units that are considerably spaced and taking advantage of the natural land. Um, general standards for a PDP, they do meet the general standards um, for the PDP. Um, parking spaces, uh, their parking design, the additional spaces that accommodate a number of an amenities through the development. <coughs> Excuse me. And there are no improvements needed to accommodate future traffic um, in order to accommodate this increase of 112 units. Um, all local streets serving the site will be constructed according to the city's requirements and be privately maintained. Um, On-site retention and detention meets or exceeds the swift mud criteria for development. Um, permit modification for any specific features will be obtained prior to site construction as part of a site um, improvement permit. Concurrency, uh, the increase is not going to affect the um, approved concurrency for any in any um, considerable way, no improvements are required for to um, maintain the adopted level of service for traffic. Sanitary sewer has adequate capacity. Potable water has adequate capacity. Solid waste um, is uh, served by the city of Bradenton, and they'll meet public work standards uh, reviewed at the time of the site improvement permit. Their recreation area um, barely exceeds, but does meet the required uh, the required 0.96 acres. <coughs> Excuse me, and the schools um, maintain the level of service standards, um, including the increase. Staff finds that the request for an increase in density only, uh, pardon me, staff finds that the request is for an increase in density only. It doesn't change any prior stipulated commitments of the original approved PDP. The total requested density is within that which is entitled by residential low density um, future land use categories, maximum of six units per acre. The proposed PDP major amendment does meet or exceed the minimum requirements of section 3.4.1.2 general PDP standards of the land use regulations based upon compliance with city land use regulations and density requirements of the comprehensive plan staff recommends approval of MA 212766 planning commission met in public hearing on September 15th 2021 and unanimously recommended approval of MA 212726. That concludes my presentation. We do have a representative here. Okay, any questions for Myra before we move to the representative? Okay, hearing that. Oh, Mr. Mr. Roth. Yeah, um, I, I don't, so <coughs> the me. reason that, um, so these are entitlements for, the reason for the increased density is that they've done things that, that gives them entitlements? Um, they were, Given um, approval for increased density in the other, um, in phase one and phase two, recognizing that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, they are entitled for more than they were originally approved for, and hoping, of course, that they could take advantage of that and um, increase the density in phase three to uh, in provide more marketable apartments. Okay, so um, with this one, is this? 
Because I'm looking at the two two letters from planning, one in uh, 2014 and one in 2017. Mm -hmm. One is for uh, minor amendments for 5055 Third Avenue East. Is that mm -hmm. is this, this this one or is that a different different phase? It would have been a different phase. The, okay, um, and, then, and then the other one would be Marsh Cove. Is that phase two? Is that a different phase? A uh, second phase. So the first amendment was for phase one. Okay. The second amendment, and also the the number I don't believe was specified in the original for each phase. And um, if it was, then they would have had to come back to you well, for I, I, this the approval. Is, I just want to make sure that as mm -hmm. I'm reading through this, that um, so in the 2014, it's a uh, uh, 5055 Third Avenue East, it does specify um, 264 multifamily units. And, and, mm -hmm. and the, the, the part that's yellowed, that you guys yellowed for me, it says mm -hmm. residential density shall not exceed over approved PDP. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing going over 2017, um, where it was specified 192. Now, these are different phases, but yes. it says density shall not. Whenever I, well, I was trained that wherever I see the word shall not, mm -hmm. a little red light should go off. So are we okay with this amendment? Yes, that's why they're back in front of you for a major amendment because it was the council that originally approved a limited number. Um, these two amendments were minor uh, amendments administratively approved, but because council made the original number administratively approval, uh, administrative approval can't be made to exceed that number. Okay, so maybe in the future they should say shall not unless amended? <laughs> okay, that's a good point. Okay, any other questions? Let the applicant come up. <clears throat> good morning, Council. For the record, my name is Stephen Thompson. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Nasby Thompson. I have been sworn uh, representing the applicant this morning. Um, the staff has really done an excellent job, I mean, very comprehensive. We worked with staff uh, for a number of months to bring this forward, and we're here to make a presentation, but I don't think based, uh, we need to repeat what was already made. Uh, again, we appreciate uh, what the staff has done. They did a, an excellent job in, in regard to the uh, presentation. We're here to answer any questions, to respond uh, if there are any uh, comments in rebuttal, uh, but uh, the Planning Commission reviewed found this request to be consistent with the comprehensive plan land development code and recommended the request unanimously the staff has also reviewed determined this request to be consistent with the comprehensive plan land development code and recommended approval so our request this morning is to make the same request to the city council and to recommend approval for this request and we're here to answer any questions that you may have and again, going to, uh, you know, Mr. Roth, I was involved in this project way back when. And at that point in time, I mean, the city of Bradenton really wasn't out there. And this was kind of a trailblazer, even with the low density, you know, Res 6. But things have changed now, and uh, we're not going above the Res 6. It's still within there. And I would suggest that that probably zoning or uh, land use classification is probably low in light of the location of the property to uh, publics and you know major thoroughfare but again we're seeking basically approval within the comprehensive plan range so uh, appreciate your right. consideration of our request all right any questions before we open the public hearing i have yes I just, so i just want to make sure i'm understanding because of with the amendments and everything sure. i was a little unclear clear the vested rights for this um, phase of it, phase three, we're not going above the vested rights for that. Or we are. Are above, we making up? You're, you're, with you're the basically others? amending the original approval by the city council, and you're increasing the density based upon the current comprehensive plan use designation of the Res 6 to allow for those a number of units to go beyond it, but still maintaining within that Res 6. Uh, category okay all right thank you thank you all right we'll open the public hearing anyone wishing to speak anyone wishing to speak anyone wishing to speak hearing none we'll close the public hearing Myra any follow-up okay thank you um, any questions or the chair will entertain a motion uh. I'll make a motion to approve 
MA 212766 as recommended by staff. All right, thank you. Second. Second, Mr. Roth, any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll start the vote in Ward 2. Yes. Three? Yes. Four? Yes. Five? Yes. One? Yes. All right, carries five to zero, and um, we're gonna move on with, I think, Myra again, but while she's coming up, I'll uh, <laughs> just say that uh, Commissioner Van Ostenbridge came in during that presentation, so welcome and thanks for being here. This is SU.21.2109, a request by Benjamin Hollins of Facility Service Corporation agent for Facility Service Corporation trustee of the 1803 Fifth Street Land Trust owner for a special use permit for a residential group care facility in the UCC Urban Commercial Corridor Zoning District. The property is located at 1803 Fifth Street West, Bradenton, Florida. Parcel ID number is 449-3800-209. Thank you. Myra Schwartz, uh, again. Um, as Tamara said, this is a request for uh, consideration for a residential group care facility in the UCC Urban Commercial Corridor. Um, <clears throat> the location is 5th Street West, just south of 17th Avenue West. Uh, adjacent to the Manatee County Juvenile Detention Center and just south of the um, county uh, vehicular, uh, vehicle maintenance yard, north of City Walk Apartments and east of some residences, car uh, repair, and the ballpark is just over here. UCC is um, the future land use, moderate density residential, entitles up to 10 dwelling units per acre, social service uses are permitted within the UCC future land use category. And the zoning is also UCC, a state licensed group care home may be permitted as a special use in UCC, which is why they're in front of you today. Adjacent uses, I just explained, here's a better view. The site is here, juvenile detention center is immediately adjacent, city walk apartments, some residential auto repair and the Manatee County vehicle maintenance yard. Um, the applicant is requesting to utilize the existing building for a group care home to house up to 20 adolescents at this time. That building has been vacant for a number of years, at least as long as I've been here for six years. The um, U, uh, UCC uh, future land use category does support a residential base density of 12, I'm sorry, 10 dwelling units per acre. And according to land use regulations, 4.3.6 <coughs> Group care homes and facilities for density purposes, six beds will uh, equal one independent unit. So that translates up to 60 beds by density entitlement. The current building, however, can't uh, safely support 60 uh, clients. Um, the initial request was to be for 30, um, pardon the typo, as that's the maximum that could be contained. Initially, that was what we thought. But um, after some discussion with fire, um, it's been decided that uh, the maximum capacity should be determined by building and fire upon inspection of the building for building permits um, because they do have an entitlement for a certain number. So the decision today, again, is not for 20, and I apologize I have not modified this. Um, it will be for an undetermined number to be determined later by fire and building for safety. Originally, this building was part of the Manatee County Juvenile Detention Center. It was constructed in 1970. The building was sold to Manatee Glens in 2011, and the building was used as an adolescent recovery center. The site and building have been vacant for more than 10 years. On August 8, 2018, City Council adopted Ordinance 3019 for a reassignment of the future land use category, residential medium density, to UCC Urban Commercial Corridor and Ordinance 3020 for a rezone from R2, one and two family residential to UCC Urban Commercial Corridor. It was approved at that time for a special use uh, for a residential group care facility in 2018 for a uh, population in a drug rehab program. That approval expired after one year as it hadn't been initiated in any way during that time. Um, the site plan, it is what it is. Um, it is not going to change. They'll be making improvements to the building and the site uh, for maintenance at this time. Um, the purpose of this one, and I have not stated yet, and the um, applicant will be up here to tell you more, is um, a residential care home for a group of 
children and adolescents at risk of sex trafficking. He can explain the uh, state regulations um, required and um, give you a better idea of what they intend. <clears throat> Your general standards of uh, land use regulation section 3.3 provides criteria for assessment of the special use permit. By now you're all very familiar with this. Um, and your group care homes um, are a specific use listed in section 4.3, so the standards of that section must also be met. Um, and in this case, they uh, are meeting that with, um, and again, density purposes, six beds equals one independent unit. <clears throat> your general standards, um, the site plan submitted for the proposed special use demonstrates compliance with the standards of the land use regulations. The plan also demonstrates the required 10-foot buffer along the west, south, and east property lines. Along with the request, the applicant um, is requesting a reduction of the north buffer from 10 feet uh, to where there is an existing dumpster access. The reduction of the buffer in this location will not affect the adjacent access and parking of the property to the north. It's a request from 10 feet to essentially zero because of the existing dumper, dumpster and access. Um, you have your review criteria to look through. I'll go briefly through those. Uh, tract of land must be suitable for the type of use proposed by virtue of its location, topography, shape, and the nature of surrounding development. The property has been historically used for a similar housing of adolescents and is suitable for this use. Adequacy of ingress and egress. The site has existing ingress and egress with adequate access to the buildings. Vehicular use is limited to staff, and that will be numbered under 10. The peak hour of a congregate care facility generally doesn't coincide with the peak hour of the adjacent street traffic, and so there will be a de minimis impact on traffic. Location and design of off-street parking and loading areas and effects to adjoining uh, properties. Um, <clears throat> there's adequate on-site parking provided. There's 17 existing parking spaces. Um, they, for 20 or 30, they would have four or five required spaces for this type of facility. So they will be, um, well over that for uh, this use. Should the applicant choose to maximize the density in the future with a new building or um, whatever <coughs> is appropriate to house that number of children, then um, increased parking must be fulfilled with a brand new site plan. Location and design of refuse and service areas in regard to availability, adequacy, and effect upon surrounding properties. The dumpster pad is located at the north side of the building, and it will be screened with opaque fencing. It served the prior use it will serve at this point, um, and any dumpster uh, waste removal is dictated by public works. Utilities in regard to location availability, adequacy, and compatibility with surrounding properties. Site was originally used as a juvenile uh, residential detention facility with existing water and sewer service to supply similar needs to the proposed use. Um, it's adequate. Screening and buffering or separation. There's existing screening. Uh, they have a 10-foot uh, uh, perimeter buffer around three sides. The north side where they're asking the reduction is adjacent um, to an um, ingress, egress point for the city vehicle maintenance. Um, the proposed signs and exterior lighting with reference to glare, traffic safety, and compatibility and harmony. Any lighting or signage will be in accordance with City of Bradenton's requirements and regulations. Effect upon the value of surrounding properties. The use will not hinder development of any nearby vacant properties. This should enhance the value of um, the surrounding properties by alleviating the vacant um, property that has been home to um, cats and um, um, human residents uh, in the neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> Review criteria further, adequacy of land and or building which are to be used. The site's adequate for the proposed use. Uh, this structure was designed to accommodate um, residential adolescent clients in a group living situation as is proposed. Um, general compatibility or appropriateness with adjacent properties and other property. The use is compatible with the existing institutional uses of the block and it'll fulfill its historic capacity as housing for adolescents. Because of the proximity to the juvenile detention center and to adjacent sites of concern to police department and Manatee County School District, um, staff is recommending a uh, stipulation to maintain the existing no climb 10 foot fence around the per uh, perimeter um, as a safety precaution for the children. Environmental quality of the district in which the use is proposed and the effect the special use permit might have on such quality. Uh, staff can see no negative effects um, to the existing environmental quality of the district as a result of the project. 
Um, <clears throat> based on staff's findings in response to the review criteria established for a special use permit, staff is recommending approval of SU 21-2109 with the following stipulations. Number one, maintain a non-climb security fence of 10 feet in height. If a gated entrance is provided, then the gate must include a method of access to EMS, police department, and fire. And number two, maximum occupancy of the facility will be subject to applicable limitations of the land use regulations, Florida Fire Code, and the Florida Building Code. Planning Commission met in public hearing on September 15th, 2021, and unanimously voted to recommend approval of SU 21-2109 as recommended by staff. Any questions for Myra? Yes, Mr. Roth. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm looking through some things here. Uh, the 30, 30 units, I, I know that building, um, that's a bit of, I, I think that's going to be pretty tight getting 30, 30 beds in there. Um, I don't see any kitchen facility. Uh, where's, is the food going to be brought in? There is a kitchen facility, and I apologize, I didn't add the interior site plan here. The applicant may have that with him. Okay. There is an interior kitchen facility. There's interior offices. There's um, yeah, I saw interior. the offices. Uh, bedrooms, some are single, some are dormitory type, um, and uh, common areas. Oh, okay, okay. So, um, and then it, coming back for it 60 beds later, um, that would need a whole nother building, I would yes. think. Uh, okay, so that's fine. Mm. 10 foot fence, do we allow 10 foot fences? Uh, you can, uh, I mean, as, a, as part of the special use, Do yes. we have them around? I'm not... In some, there are some in um, other locations, some industrial locations um, that have been permitted. This uh, fence was actually um, approved with the prior special use for the drug rehabilitation facility, and it's been in existence there for some time. Okay, and then, um, and then the last thing I saw was, uh, it had said, um, it looked like uh, different uh, comments from the Development Review Committee um, it said it would be beneficial to contact Manti County Health Department for more details. Have they been involved? Because this is kind of, we're, we don't really do health no. department issues. No, we have a representative from the health department uh, um, who does attend our DRC meetings and makes comments. At this time, she had no comment except to give them the information to contact her. This is a, will be a state-regulated um, Department of um, Children and Families facility. Okay. And, well, and then lastly, so are these, um, are these clients, um, are they, so they're saying this is state run, are these clients going to be clients that live in the area or are we bringing them in from other areas, do we know? The, I'm going to let the applicant give you the detail of the actual operation. My understanding is that this is a safe refuge location for children at risk. All right, yeah. I'm done. Mrs. Coker? Well, he kind of, mine was more about who was going to be living here with regard to that fencing. All right, well, we can ask the applicant. Okay. Or maybe he'll, he's heard it, he can explain it as we go. All right, we'll move on to the applicant. Thank you, Myra. Thank you, Myra. Hello, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, it's Thank you. <laughs> How are you doing this morning? Uh, my name is Benjamin Hollins, and I'm a representative of, of 1803 Fifth Street Land Trust, which is the trust that uh, holds title to this property. Um, this application is for a special use permit for Children's Safe Place LLC, DBA, Horizons Care, in conjunction with the 1803 Fifth Street Land Trust, who purchased the former juvenile detention center located at 1803 Fifth Street West, Bradenton, Florida, 
34205. Uh, Children's Safe Place LLC is requesting the ability to now use this property and business as a building as a residential group care facility for adolescents that are at risk of being sex trafficked. A facility licensed by DCF as a CCA, Child Caring Agency, under 65C-14 of the Administrative Code, which will offer secure residential care and th therapeutic care, providing outlined service plans and group counseling. Professional services will be delivered by a team of multifaceted avenues of approach with operations 24 hours a day and seven days a week and is a license by DCF to serve in and out of home care for adolescents who are at risk of being sex trafficked as described in section 39.524 in need of safe harbor placement and who meet the placement criteria for this inherent purpose. The facility will initially house 30 residents. The duration of residency will vary depending on the department's needs of placement for the youth until either they reach the point of reunification, adoption, or they age out. The proposed residential group care facility will op be operated by Nelson Hurdle and Jacqueline Collins through Children's Safe Place LLC, a licensed CCA child caring agency. Nelson Hurdle has a Juris Doctorate in Law, an MS in Industrial Administration, and he's a Certified Project Manager Professional, PMP, from the Project Management Institute. He served as a Program Manager and Executive Director successfully for 17 years, providing long-term foster care and youth development services to young men the ages 13 to 18. Jacqueline Collins has been a program director of Children's Safe Place for over four years and held a Department of Children and Families licensed child care facility in Manatee County for 13 years. She has experience working with children and families from age zero to 13. She also provided services through the Early Learning Coalition, Southwest Food Program, and member of the Florida Child Care Association. The subject parcel located at 1803 5th Street West is an, was an existing juvenile detention center currently zoned UCC Urban Commercial Corridor. The subject parcel has historically been used as an institutional land use since at least the 1970s. The building has most recently been used as a uh, mental crisis facility and is well suited to be repurposed as a residential group care facility for adolescents at risk of being sex trafficked. Due to the sensitive nature of the children's situation of being at risk of being sex trafficked and other forms of human trafficking, we requested that the 10-foot non-scalable fence remain in place. This is not deemed a lockdown facility, however, it is very restrictive. While they cater to minors who have some come from very abusive and traumatizing situations, and sometimes they find their way back to their abuser or the person who has victimized them. If a child requests to leave the premises, they will be required to sign out only under some circumstances will they be allowed to leave unsupervised after providing an approved amount of information to the staff on shift, and they must meet program age requirements to do so. If the children decide that they no longer want to reside at the facility, it is arranged for their pickup and transportation to a safe place for them to reside. The current prohibitory architecture of the existing building is ideal because it prevents them from putting themselves in imminent danger while also diminishing any impact to the surrounding neighborhoods from any mischievous behaviors. The proposed uses for this building is in sync with its historical usage of this building, which has extraordinary little impact on the large multifamily residential zone property located to the south of the building. Uh, we request a 10-foot buffer be reduced from 10 feet to zero on the north side of the property. It is currently an institutional building used for vehicle maintenance for the city. The subject property currently neighbors the juvenile detention center to the east and the city vehicle maintenance to the north. There is no impact on adjacent properties that sit to the east and the north since the existing properties serve institutional usage as our proposed property does. The property to the north will not be impacted. It is the parking lot. The multifamily neighborhood is fenced with heavily foliage between the two properties that would be harmonious with the proposed land use and provide natural partition between the properties. If you would see exhibit A. Moreover, the building that is designed to be used as a juvenile detention facility, the building only has a limited number of land uses that would spatially work on this site. The proposed usage not only coincides with its previous usage that has created no impact to the neighborhood to the south, but is also very secure with fencing, dense vegetation. 
the building secure and almost isolated and positioning to serve a good neighbor to the land use around it. Due to its use as adolescent residential group care, none of the residents will have vehicles and will cut down on any traffic noise that would minimize any impact on any other surrounding land use. The residents will be monitored through closed circuit uh, camera system and will receive 24-hour supervision. The current building has been abandoned and unmaintained for several years, and the applicant is intending on making substantial investment into the property, into the re revitalization of this property, will be an asset to the neighborhood. Um, to specifically answer to your question, um, DCF uh, contracts with a third-party case management. So when kids are removed from traumatizing situations, they're placed with the case management who then reside. So they can potentially come from around, but they are contracted locally with Manatee County. So the 90% of the residents that would be at that facility are from the Manatee County area. Any other questions, Mr. Sanders? Um, do you have the map of the um, building? Can you? I saw it. Uh, you were talking about uh, the north side. You need yes. that barrier. <coughs> yes. I'm familiar with the building, and it's. And how many how many staff workers will be there? It's 24-7, obviously. It's just right. It's 24-7. It's, I believe the ratio is six staff to every, I mean, one staff to every six kids. So about five. So about five staff. Five staff. Yes, on, on three, three, three shifts. Three shifts. Yes. So oh, that's the only, the traffic that would be there. R correct. Is there any other uh, the, the other traffic would be uh, case management that may come from DCF or gar guardians of item from the court. Is the there court any uh, other security measures with? you know, county or city or anything that's no, required? No, no, no. That's uh, just, we. they will implement a 24-hour surveillance camera, and that's why they were asking for the remaining of the fence because of the sensitive nature of the residents that will uh, be there. They ask that the fence remain in place. If you would point to the north side on this, it's hard for me to see that, where you're asking for, or what are you asking for? Repeat. Okay. Uh, where the buffer would be on this side over yeah. here. Okay. There's actually a dumpster that was already in place right here, uh -huh. and there's the vehicle maintenance yard that sits right to that side. Mm -hmm. So would there be any issues with our, our, our ingress, egress from there from the city, Mr. Uh, Perry, or do you know? I think that would be a better question suited probably for uh, planning as far as their review of uh, that issue. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's not going to affect anything. It's existing. It's not going to change at all. Um, it won't affect any uh, ingress egress for the county. And, and I would just uh, additionally point. I don't know what uh, Ms. Schwartz has done in regards to uh, cor uh, corresponding that question with Public Works as it relates to traffic engineering and, and their interest in that. If that is just planning's opinion or whether Public Works has looked at that. Have as they well. weighed in on that? Um, yes, this did go through development review with. Um, uh, full departmental I mean, staff. Yeah. Okay. So long, long as there's no, no, as they uh, sign off on that, that takes care of our existing facilities. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Mrs. Coachman. Um, I, thank you for this. So it's definitely needed. Sadly, it's needed. Um, but I'm concerned about security, though. Okay. Um, there's just going to be staff. There's not going to be any other security officers or company or. No, a, a lot of the staff that are hired, they have staff that work with the Department of Corrections, the Department of Juvenile Justice. That's so kind of the staff okay. that's in line for this. So they're suited for this type of purpose. Um, outside of that, the, f the front door does remain locked for their safety. But it, they're just not in a lockdown facility, oh, so the kids no, are, not, not, you know, if, yeah. if approved and if of the right age requirement, they are able to leave. So if if, a, if they're a teenager and they acquire a job, but the, the staff is, you know, they have to look at where they're going, look mm -hmm. into where they're going, they have to sign out, they keep very close tabs on them. Well, and then my, my concern is really keeping them safe. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Do you have any renderings of, of what this may look like. I mean, the last time that 
this was approved by the council, I believe in 2018, uh, there were some renderings of, of, of what it would look like and it was very good. Do you have anything right. like that yet? No, they're, they're planning to use the consistent building. They're gonna do renovations and bring whatever's necessary up to code, but they're not gonna do the complete build out like Dr. Zadie did yeah. uh, prior. Um, you know, he, I believe he was going to knock it down and turn it to about 11,000. It was beautiful plans. I saw yeah, it. Yeah, I saw that. They're, they're going to use the existing and, and, and bring it up to the current code and, and re-renovate it. So, so no yeah. outside uh, uh, improvements to the... the uh, landscaping. That's landscaping, yeah, but, but nothing no, to the no, building. No major, no major improvements to the building. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, outside of the renovation and, and the, you know, re-beautification of it. Yeah, yeah. Mrs. Coker? Uh, yeah, what, what is the square footage of this building? Uh, the complete square footage is about 7,500 square feet, and there's an additional 1,000 square foot classroom portable in the back. Oh, okay. And do you know the room dimensions of, of these bedrooms? Um, I don't the, see anything noted. No. The dimensions in here, I know that uh, I believe that they require 50, a, a minimum of 50 square feet. The small single rooms, I believe, were between 60 and 75 square foot. Uh, the requirement is 50 feet by the Department of Children and Family. Um, so the way that the, they're positioned fits the square footage of those rooms. So with the beds that are placed, they fall within the requirements. In the room that's got eight beds, uh, do you know the dimensions of that? Yes, it's, uh, I believe, 400, 400 square feet. So? I, I believe four, is it four? Four by ten? No, 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 no. It's it's um. No, forty by forty by ten. Okay. All right, Mrs. Barnaby. Oh no, I was okay. just trying uh, to. Yeah, it's a, all right, was, yes, sir. Right. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council, I, I appreciate Mr. Holland's bringing this before Council. It's obviously a particularly sensitive use in the community. Um, there's, there's certainly a need, and it serves a, a great criminal justice pur purpose, but it also has questions that have only been vetted through the perspective and lens of the planning department, not the police department that may have issues, not the fire department that might have emergency medical issues and the like. Um, I, I certainly see criminal justice benefit to this. I'm an individual that's run a prison system have a lot of experience in transitional homes, use of contractors to do that, security concerns into those neighborhoods and the surrounding areas. I would recommend that we basically continue this and allow Mr. Mr. Hollins, on behalf of his client, Children's Safe Place, DBA, Horizons Care, to take this to the Bradenton Police Department mm -hmm. and to speak with the chief as well as the fire department and answer some questions before an ultimate decision is made in that regard. Before the council, of course, this matter is a public hearing with a quasi-judicial uh, uh, component to it, in essence. And uh, uh, if Mr. Rudisell would like to comment on the possibility of that um, continuance and the implications of it, I'd, 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 that would be my recommendation if, if, at this time. If I could interrupt for one second. Um, I believe at the planning commission hearing, the police department was present and did have some questions. So all of those questions were answered. Oh. And I appreciate Mr. Hollins helping us educate council. When I had the conversation with our chief of police out in the hall, this was all news to her. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Mr. Rudisell and then Mr. Roth. Yeah. Well, uh, typically we, uh, it is the applicant's decision whether or not to continue the public hearing. They have the right, if they wish to proceed and have a decision made, they have the right to do that. Um, if there are concerns, it may be advisable for them to, to request the continuance. Um, I, it would, I would like to hear from staff as because it was, it's my understanding that typically law enforcement and fire are involved in the review process. If that, if that didn't happen, I'd like to get that on the record so that we have a basis for why we're we're asking for it to be continued. 
And as it relates to those questions, I think the depth and scope of those types of inquiries into fire and police would be important. I see the fire marshal in the back of the room. If the fire marshal's depth and scope of review was whether it meets uh, fire safety, that's one issue. If the fire department's concern is regarding emergency response, cost, associated incidents, and the like, that's an entirely separate matter. And I would not be comfortable without vetting this project at that level, answering those types of questions, which would be of policy making concern. Mr. Roth? Yeah, um, and, and I, I, I agree with the, because uh, I'm just looking at this building. I, I know the building, I've been in there. Um, putting 30 kids in, I mean, and, and, and I think everybody wants to take care of the kids. I, I think everybody here wants to look after children's safety, and so it's a, it's a noble cause. Um, I'm just looking at the uh, 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 allow uh, you know uh, putting that many children in there. Um, I just want to make sure it works. You know that that we have a, a that, that that's a reasonable amount. Um, I I, I counted uh, five bathrooms and I'm counting with staff 35 people. It seems like not enough toilets. I mean I'm just just so that's a public health issue. I don't know how to. I don't think we, we deal with that, but, but I think if we approve this, we're saying, well, this is okay by us. The city of Bradenton put this full weight in that. So I think we need to look at that. And then the, the, uh, the question came up of the portable. That's a very old portable. Um, I'd wanna, those things tend to fall apart. I know that teachers go through the floor all the time. That should be reviewed before, I mean, uh, total building inspection on that because those things are, they're made out of fiber wood. Yeah. Absolutely. There are uh, plans that will be going through plan and development to pull all the required permits to bring everything to a satisfactory level. Um, as far as uh, the mention of the restrooms, mm -hmm. it falls under the DCF administrative code mm -hmm. for the allotment of bathrooms per residence. Okay. It does meet those requirements. It does? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Um, at this time, I'd be interested in hearing from our fire marshal and maybe also from the police department as to the level of um, vetting that it's had. So yes. Far. Yes, I agree. So, thank you. Um, Scott, is this the appropriate, or should we go to the public hearing, or just let them? No, I think it's okay to ask questions of staff. I'm kind of being briefed as we, we go here, and, and I'm aware that we do have a member that sits on the Planning Commission, and maybe down the road we need to maybe review what the intent of his position is. It's always been to provide more of a septed type positional opinion and not necessarily on use per se, just from a structural standpoint if we're looking at it from a safety perspective, and so that might be something we need to do down the road and, and I've been made aware that there's been a couple different ideas floated for this building and this is the most recent one. What I can tell you is that we do have a similar facility within the city um, that was approved quite some time ago and just since March between the police and fire we've responded there 70 times um, for a variety of issues concerning juveniles, runaways, what have you and so security within the facility is always a, an issue particularly if they can come and go because the, the door in essence is wide open um, and so I'm not sure I can offer anything beyond the fact that it is a, a very big draw on police resources I, I would suspect I don't I think the numbers of the other facility is a little bit less than this proposal or is it pretty equal maybe I'm not sure the the numbers at this other facility but I think this one is higher so um, you know you're looking at quite a draw when it comes to resources and I you know we can do a little bit more um, research on this but just something to keep in mind right and I think that may be a reason for a continuance because again not to deny it today but to continue it on because there could be some apples and apples comparisons um, because if it does become a draw on our police department that creates a huge issue with budgeting for us in the future and, and obviously there's no doubt it's a noble cause. I mean, we, we need the facilities, but it's got to be the right time and right place. Absolutely, and I actually sit on a, a Tampa Bay consortium on, on sex trafficking, and, and I'm actually interested in learning a little bit more about how we designate a, a, a child at risk for sex trafficking. 
um, just to maybe get a little bit more insight on, on that. We do have facilities within the county. We um, actually have um, given a lot of time and resources to various facilities that are, um, or, or um, um, organizations that are committed to um, helping folks with that. And so I, I'd actually like to learn a bit more and maybe we can figure out what we can do to, to help in that endeavor more as well. Question. Question. Mr. Sanders. Um, in other facilities, uh, I've been told that um, sometimes the surrounding environment around the, the facility, probably more so with uh, drug addiction facilities, uh, become a problem for the police department and others because they seem to attract uh, <coughs> unwanted on the streets and so forth because they may have a friend or a family member in there and that's where a lot of the issues come. Is that what your experience is with the other one? So um, correct me if I'm wrong and, and maybe Councilman Roth will recall, but I thought this same exact property was um, considered for a, a, a drug, drug rehab drug. It about was, three in years ago. And yeah. I, I was aware that the council um, approved it three to two. Right. Okay. It was a three to two vote. It, it, so. it was controversial. Oh, okay. I, controversial. I thought it got shot down, but no, uh, it was approved. No, no, I, I think it squeaked by, but okay, there was, there was concern. Yeah, so th this property has. We've looked at this from from time to time, just because of right. where it's at and and you know the the land surrounding it. But well, and also we are trying to make this more of an entertainment district, and that was the big concern back then of what we continue to put in a neighborhood if we're trying to build that neighborhood to a different uh, yeah, synopsis. I, I mean, perhaps I, the only thing I could bring is I'd like to know specifically um, where these uh, minors are coming from. Are these um, deferred arrest? Are these um, folks that have been, you know, I, I don't know all the answers to Ms. that. Mayor, I mean, I mean that's, that's the obvious thing to me is that we do not know the status. They've been characterized this morning as at-risk um, juveniles, basically. Um, for sex trafficking. Well, are they pretrial detainees awaiting disposition of the criminal justice system? Are they, are they under court supervision itself on probation or some other, some other type of status? Uh, are they post-sentence um, individuals and the like? And to be honest with you, you know, it's certainly a noble cause and there's countervailing interest here, but I think we need full disclosure, full understanding before any decision is made. I think right. I can answer a few yeah, of those. Let us, can we get to the fire marshal oh, first? Sure, and that sure. way then we can kind of have the rest of staff. I appreciate it, though. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we have been involved with the uh, process. That was one of the reasons why we recommended um, that their occupant load not be as high as it is because we want to make sure that everything is correct. And, yes, we do have a problem with responding to certain type of occupancies like that. Um, so we have looked at both sides of it, and that's the reason we put in the stipulation of us making the occupant load, not just saying 30 people there, because we don't believe that 30 people can fit in that building. Mm. All right. Questions? No. Right. What, what, uh, what, Mr. Langston, what, what would your, what would your, because I, 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 I understand that there's a need and putting 30 people, obviously there's bunk beds and all that stuff. It looks like it's a tight squeeze to me and I'm not, I'm, I don't have your job. Right, it's it, the state requirement or the state requirement is a little different than the fire code. Mm -hmm. um, the fire code reads that most people need 100 square feet per person. Um, I have to look at the code again to make sure that that's correct on this type of occupancy. But it looks tight very tight so that's the reason we made the stipulation that from the building code and the fire code that will make the occupancy load not the people here yes ma'am miss barnaby so fire marshal langston are you saying that you would let's say we put you in charge tomorrow <clears throat> what do you think would be an appropriate number of people in there i don't have all the calculations in front of me but um, it's according to what the other uses are in there. I know there's got offices and other things like that, but I think that there's more like 10 to 15 people, not 30. Okay. Thank you. And again, Do that's we, why we want to get all of the information so you can give us the educated number 
not a guess right now because exactly. I, that wouldn't be fair to the applicant no. either to be guessing. And I think that's, that's again, why we're probably going to suggest a continuance to make it have the opportunity to succeed. So, Mr. Roth. Is there, because I, I think it was um, ARC was the, the reason that when this was built, it was, it was adult, re, uh, it was adolescent recovery, recovery center. center. Yeah. And so that was a, that was a, it was basically juvenile detention. That was, it was built for that. Do we, do we have in our records what they had in there? I mean, because that, that, that building was designed for that. We'll have to look. So, I and then the other thing I think that has been brought up, um, you know, and, and certainly kids in need should be helped and everything, but um, I know that for a while there, being, being the councilman for Ward 3, um, we had a program that was run through Salvation Army, I think it was. Anyway, I think it was called Viper or something like that, where, where there were the, the state prison system was releasing inmates early and bringing them to Bradenton through our Salvation Army. It was not, it wasn't the best thing that ever happened to Ward 3. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. All right, thank you. Um, just, just, to, just trying to clear up as many questions as I can uh, with our time here. Um, as to the question with the gentleman uh, about the, I guess, the disposition of, of the kids, uh, a lot of these kids are the victims. They're not uh, the felony. Now, there are kids, juveniles, that get in trouble as kids do, so they may have, you know, a court case. But most of these kids are removed from terrible situations, and that is the, the reason for this. This is going to be a safe harbor for them. Um, to be removed from these situations, uh, the stories go on. So I think it's important to remember that these kids are the victims of most of the time in this situation. They're not, you know, the aggressors. Okay, Mrs. Coachman. Yes, and and I was actually thinking from that standpoint more so the victims, which, and the reason why I said keeping them safe because if they've been plucked out of some horrific, dangerous situation. Um, everybody involved probably did not get arrested <laughs> and they're going to know where they are. So you know, that was where I was thinking more so safety. And then, of course, behaviors do come with young people that have experienced things. Right. So, and, and that's kind of understandable, but it's two sides to this, this sword, that's for sure. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Ms. Barnaby? Yes, thank you. Mr. Hollins, is this a co ed facility? Or is this just primarily for one? No, it's, it's for young boys. Okay. Um, listening to what I'm hearing, I'm, I'm going to say something that I used to say to my boys that I raised, which was, do you want a slow yes or a fast no? Right. <laughs> we'll take a slow yes. <laughs> uh, well, sir, then I, if, if it were me, I would request a continuance. Absolutely. So is there uh, anything in specific that we, that the council would want us to provide? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, and I appreciate you coming in here, and I appreciate you being able to add a little bit more definition to, to, to what the purpose of this facility is, as well as the occupancy and the program related to and the like. And, and, and I support that type of program as well. I understand that sometimes delirious conditions arise from that, but recognizing there's a balance, as, as pointed out by Councilor Coachman. I think, quite honestly, it would help this council if yourself got together with the, someone representing us from the fire department and the police department and perhaps another department so that we get a full picture of what special use we would be approving for this permit and perhaps restrictions that might be related to it. Maybe it isn't 30, maybe it's 28, 26. I know that you know there, there is a pro forma that's related to it as well that has to be realistically derived. And uh, you know the bathrooms and, and you know when, when I ran prisons, the ACA stand, American Correctional Association, was 80 square feet per prisoner in a cell. This is 100 square feet, not a whole lot more. And these folks aren't in a cell. And so those kinds of things I think we do have to consider. When I see the element about a 10-foot non-climbable fence, to me, 
That smacks of a detention facility. And, and the council just has to be aware, what is it you're approving in this community? And, and hopefully we can get something together. The objective, the aim of what you're doing is good stuff. I don't yeah, think anybody so has Rudy, a problem. So, Mr. Rudisell, we probably need to open the public hearing to give anybody here today the opportunity to speak right. if they want to come back. So, all right, so let us do that, and then we'll come back for, we'll allow him to come back up. One more comment? Yes, ma'am. Because he ahead. asked, well, I think that you just touched on, I mean, this is outside my wheelhouse, but that was, if these are victims, putting them into something that looks like a prison, I, I just think it's just almost like, making them victims again. So that was my concern when I was th seeing 10 foot razor wire fencing surrounding it. But of course we want to make them safe, but th that was the only thought that I had. So. All right. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Did you have something else? Well, I, it, the point being said, because a 10 foot, 10 foot non climbable fence, I, I don't know of one in the city. Um, so I, I guess a, a visualization of what that what that would look like too. Okay, um, you are yeah the fence. So is so so good, and and I get it. Okay, the, there, there's a detention center behind it. Mm -hmm. I recognize that. There's a water treatment plant over there. There's and then there's an apartment building, and then across the street, I mean there's a cremation. Right. You know there's a garage. So it's not as though this isn't a smack dab in the middle of a. You know, I, I, the, the, the case was made, the entertainment district before, what the, this is actually a, a not quite their neighborhood. So I, I would like to work with you, but I need, I need better, better information than this. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. We'll go ahead. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We'll open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak? Anyone wishing to speak? Anyone wishing to speak? We'll close well, it. No, uh, I would Don't not close, close it. You're right. Don't close it. I'm sorry. Right. I didn't mean yeah, to. No, interject. I'm glad you said that because as soon as you said it, I thought of it. So we won't close the public hearing. We'll just continue it. Are we, right, is please. the applicant making that request? Got my papers too. Yep. In the public hearing? Yes. I would like to make a formal request to, for a continuance. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else we need to do, Mr. Rudisell, for that? We'll need to have a motion to continue. I, I don't know. Do we want to do that to a time and date certain at this time? Do we have, do we know how much time we'll need at the staff level to review? I, I think somewhere in the order of 60 days, a couple of months would probably be ample. Um, we may have to, to get with, uh, with Mr. Hollins and then maybe do some diligence of our own. Um, in, in checking some things and the like. So but yeah, I, th I think to give 30 days is going to be kind of a short time window. That might be, a, you know, a, we might be f faced with, as um, Councilwoman Barnaby says, another fast no or fast yes or something like that. Well, yes, fast no. Yes. <laughs> so, but 60 days if that was the motion, but or sooner if it can be done. Well, we need an, an, a specific date and time certain or else we'll have to re-advertise for the public hearing. So I, that's that's what the question. Do you have a date? I, I would suggest January because of the upcoming holidays. And I don't think we have uh, but one scheduled meeting in each of those two months. So we have I think three we're three more meetings before the end of the year. And then so maybe the first meeting. I'd in January. say the first meeting of January because if not, we're gonna not going to have enough time to review. That's my personal opinion. I think it's a good Mr. Ch Mr. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. I see um, department head Singer standing up. I don't know if she had something to add. I was just going to mention advertising. We can advertise if, if they can bring back information sooner. Okay. Well, Mr. Mayor, at this time, I'd like to make a motion that we continue this public hearing until our first regularly scheduled meeting in January. I don't have that date in front January of me. January 12th. Okay, continue, continue this till January 12th. Okay, we have a motion and a second by Mr. Sanders. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll start the vote in Ward 3. Yes. 4. Yes. 5. Yes. 1. Yes. 2. Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> All right, moving forward. Thank you. Our last public hearing this morning is SU.21.2802, 
Request by Bowler Engineering LLC agent for JBCC Manatee LLC owner for a special use permit to operate a restaurant with over 20 seats in the SCC Suburban Commercial Corridor Zoning District. The property is located at 4311 Manatee Avenue West, Bradenton, Florida 34205. Parcel ID number is 364870056. Thank you. Okay, hey, Myra Schwartz for the last time today. Um, I promise. Um, this is a request uh, for a special use consideration for a restaurant with over 20 seats, and it does have a drive through service in the suburban commercial corridor zoning district. The address is 4311 Manatee Avenue West. Um, the subject parcel off of Manatee Avenue uh, between 43rd Street West and 44th Street West. Suburban Commercial Corridor, uh, future land use category does support the uses that are corresponding with sub uh, suburban arterial roadways, such as drive-through restaurants and other restaurants. Um, it is uh, a restaurant and a drive-through um, are permitted in special uses. Between them, mixed use and non-residential land use Atlas District does require a special use permit for a restaurant over 20 seats in the SCC zoning, while a drive-through restaurant is a permitted use in SCC. Subject property is southwest of Manatee Avenue and 43rd Street West. Um, across 43rd Street West is the Jesse P. Miller Elementary School, the Brown and Sons Funeral Home. Um, you have Regis Bank on the other side, and um, over here is Manatee County. This is our city border right here. The existing use is a vacant, <coughs> pardon me, drive through facility uh, for a bank. This is the proposed site plan. You all have a better image of that in your packets. Um, it has been reviewed by Public Works, um, by fire, by all departments in uh, several DRC reviews. Um, and again, you're familiar with the criteria that is um, uh, for your decision for a special use permit application. Um, and also, it includes the use listed as a specific use in section 4.3, the standards for uh, a drive through restaurant. So we're going to go through those briefly. We'll start with the general standards for drive through. Um, they're pretty basic. The project does exceed the requirements of land use regulations 4.1, 4.3 for a minimum nine foot wide drive lane. Uh, this project has drive lanes that are a minimum of 10 feet and it uh, has double drive lanes. The lanes accommodate up to 52 stacked vehicles, and that far exceeds the minimum requirement of um, five vehicle accommodation for the lanes. The um, review criteria, we're going to go over the first one a little bit more in depth, adequacy of ingress and egress. The two existing access points for the site um, that are closest to the intersections with Manatee Avenue are going to be closed off. The remaining two access points that are further south are going to have in and out access to both 43rd Street West and 44th Street West. The access provided to um, 43rd Street is of some concern because of its proximity to the elementary school. There are public sidewalks that exist along Manatee Avenue West and 43rd Street West, and a new public sidewalk is um, proposed to be added along 44th Street West. Um, there, as I said, there were some concerns about the proximity of uh, the in and out to 43rd Street. Both the school board and the police have raised traffic concerns for traffic entering from and exiting uh, to 43rd Street West, especially during school pickup and drop off times. We'll go into that in depth a little bit further. The school district does employ traffic control officers during school times for traffic exiting the school, and uh, that's to help mitigate the existing traffic congestion. Um, a traffic study was done for the project, uh, indicates approximately 202 new trips. That does not include existing um, passerby capture. The morning peak hour is 7.30 to 8.30 a.m. <coughs> that attracts approximately 103 new trips. The p.m. peak hour is 4 to 6, and that attracts approximately 81 new trips. The, um, uh, if we're talking about peak hours, we want to talk about the pickup and drop-off times for the school. So. Um, the school hours are 8.25 a.m. to 3.15 p.m. That's their school day. So the afternoon pickup time is outside of the um, restaurant's p.m. hours. Uh, the pickup time is a little bit earlier. The morning uh, peak does coincide with the drop-off time, but this is not going to be what we would expect the busier time for the restaurant. 
um, staff suggests a detailed stipulation that the applicant will continue to work with the city of Bradenton and the police to ensure that any traffic conflicts at school pick up and drop off times be resolved. I'll read that at the end of my presentation. Um, further criteria, the location and design of off street parking and loading areas and the effects to the adjoining properties. The parking lot, the parking areas are consolidated to the middle of the site and this maximizes the distance um, of the drive through lanes from the adjacent properties to the south. Um, Glare is minimized by landscape screening with a required landscape buffer. Uh, refuse and service areas. Um, the dumpster pad is designed to be at the rear of the building. Any refuse facility, including the dumpster location, is required to comply with all city requirements and is subject to public works approval during the site improvement permit development review process. Um, screening and buffering and separation of any nuisance or hazardous uh, features of the site. Um, there is uh, a minimum 10 foot perimeter buffer that will be maintained um, as is required by the general standards for a special use permit. The order menu boards uh, where you might um, expect some noise are located at a maximum distance from adjacent property owners and closer to Manatee Avenue. Proposed signs and exterior lightings with reference to glare, traffic safety and compatibility in harmony with surrounding properties. Lighting and signage of course as in all other uses will be in accordance with the City of Bridenton's regulations. Effect upon the value of surrounding properties, the use shall not hinder development of nearby vacant properties or adversely affect their economic value. The proposed project, project is a compatible use in the suburban commercial corridor and uh, is not expected to as adversely affect the economic value of any surrounding property. Adequacy of land and or building which are to be used. The project is similar to the existing use, although with a greater intensity and the site does accommodate the proposed building. Um, it will be a teardown of the bank and a, a reconstruction of a new building and related improvements while meeting city standards for site design. General compatibility or appropriateness with adjacent properties and other property in the district with special consideration given to proposed hours of operation. The proposed project is consistent with other commercial development in the area and it's an appropriate addition to the suburban commercial corridor. Hours of operation are to be consistent with regular dining hours. Environmental quality of the district, um, their staff sees no negative impacts to the existing environmental quality of the district. Um, consistency with comprehensive plan. The proposed use is consistent with the site's underlying future land use designation of suburban commercial corridor, which supports uses that correspond with suburban arterial roadways such as gas stations, car washes, drive through restaurants, mini storage, retail, office, auto automotive sales, automotive repair, and service hotel, motel, restaurants, and social services. Staff finds that the rec request does meet all of the criteria um, that's necessary to review for establishing a special use permit and is therefore recommending approval of the request SU-212802 with the following stipulation. Um, and I will read this uh, to you. Planning Commission also reviewed this and is recommending as uh, approved by staff. So in the event city staff determines that the project's actual traffic impacts create safety or operational conflicts with the existing elementary school then city staff may require the property owner to implement additional or modified traffic control measures as may be necessary to address the condition. Such measures may include but are not limited to the following. Change of circulation patterns in the parking lot. Use of parking lot for drive through circulation during peak hours. Additional directional markings and signage. Changes in hours of operation of drive through. Hiring of increased police presence for traffic control. Possible right turn only exit from 44 43rd Street West access point and any other traffic control devices or practices as required by city staff. Um, staff felt that something was needed that was this art articulate, this detailed, because the project does meet all of our requirements. It absolutely does in, in a technical uh, standpoint, but because there are concerns, because the school is across the street, because there's already some traffic issues, um, traffic, the traffic study did not come up with any uh, flags, any problems, but the reality is that there may be something in the future and we want to make sure that the applicant is willing to work with us. We have discussed this with the applicant and they are in agreement with the stipulation. At this point, I'll conclude my um, presentation. If you have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer. The applicant is here and can give you a more detailed presentation. Okay, any questions for Myra at this time? Um, Mr. Roth? Yeah, just looking at this, I, I, you know, it's it's a big property. Uh, it looks like a good, a good fit on a large property. It's actually uh, certainly plenty of parking. The only the only uh, 
issue I see that you've addressed with the possible right turn only on 43rd. I used to bank there before it got closed down. Now, it, that was a very, when I was banking there, I was one of the few going in and out of there. It was a very low use, uh, you know, in-person banking. Um, trying to get out on 43rd when school is letting out, or e even even when school is in, in, in session, because uh, parents are coming in and out of there all the time. That's a very busy school. Gosh, getting, uh, you know, going going left can just be really dangerous because you're sitting there waiting for a light. 43rd is a busy street all by itself, people going, uh, uh, you know, north-south. Uh, you want to try to get a light. The parents are coming in and out of there with the kids. You, you almost feel obligated to jump in front of traffic. Uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's risky. So since this is going to be a heck of a lot higher usage, I, I think it's, it's a great idea. I was always wondering why there wasn't a Chick-fil-A, uh, you know, in the area, and I was hoping for one on 14th Street. So hint, hint, wink, wink. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, that's the only thing I see is, is that, you know, I think that they can get in and out of 44th. You can do a right turn only. But, you know, I, I can attest that, that getting, doing a left turn uh, on that intersection is dangerous. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Coker. Yeah, I, I would just say, but if anyone can make it work, it'll be Chick-fil-A. We all have seen that. And I think that they're going to, I kind of agree with you, they're probably going to see that anybody trying to turn left is going to back up their whole operation. But I, I think uh, the way that you've written it so that if they don't figure it out on their own and we have to, we still have the ability to step in afterwards. Uh, I like the way they wrote the exceptions. Yeah, and then one of the things probably uh, on this dais, I'm the most familiar with that every day for the last 26 years. Yeah, people are uh, dying to get there. Right, yeah, so, um, and, and uh, about seven or eight years ago when the school remodeled, they were not going to put an officer there. And when we had a new superintendent change, the officer, um, and as Ward 2 council person at that time, had to make sure that we had an officer there during this peak school hours because of the traffic, not because the traffic couldn't control itself, it was the people that were blocking the box and not allowing the parents to come out. So it, it created, and then at one year they eliminated it because it was a budget issue, and as the city we had to remind them that they were obligated to do that because we allowed them to leave their drive where it was when their drive should have been moved down to 7th Avenue. So, you know, that's a cost the school district has to have, which I'm, I'm very comfortable with <coughs> the stipulations and let let the process play out you know and we're seeing that on 26th street that it's playing out with another business that we've got to figure it out but let's let the process stay out because we are the friendly city and we want to allow people to meet within our codes and and obligations that we have so mrs barnaby thank you mr mayor uh yes i i too am very familiar although i don't work on the on uh, 43rd street but <coughs> Uh, when this council did allow the school to maintain their drive through the way that they did, um, I personally think it was a mistake we made. And it, uh, I think it's only gotten worse with COVID because when, shoot, when my kids went there, I would park at the Westgate parking lot and walk them in. Well, you can't walk children into school anymore. So you've got more people going through the drive through and it's a, I mean, it's, it, it's a very heavily traveled thoroughfare there. I personally think the only time or the only day that having a Chick-fil-A there <coughs> would be a traffic issue was Sunday. <laughs> um, and I know that it says they're going to have the ability to stack 52 vehicles. It's been my experience that having a Chick-fil-A is pretty much a license to print money because you have people going there all the time. It's not just during a lunch hour. It's, it's a very popular restaurant. Um, I know my family would be ecstatic to have one closer to where we live. I'm just 
am concerned that we're trying to put 10 pounds of potatoes in a five pound sack. And that's where my concern is. I still need some convincing. Right. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Mayor. Mr. Sanders, did you answer? Uh, no, I don't okay. have any questions. So no, 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 thank you. All right, so we'll let the applicant come up at this time. And Can I make one other oh, comment? Oh, sure. Yes, um, I understand that the county has a plan for improving that intersection there. And I noticed our, one of the people that's championing it is here if he, if he wanted to address any of that. It would have to be under, under public comment. Okay. Mm. All right, thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Greg Roth with Bowler Engineering, and I have been sworn in. Um, with me today is Michael Yates of Palm Traffic, who did the traffic analysis. Uh, I'm just a civil engineer who plays in the dirt and lays out site plans. Um, but that is very important on this project, so we'll get right into that. Um, first and foremost, just want to thank uh, Myra and staff. I think throughout the process, it's been a lot of help in, in even crafting that stipulation. I give all the credit to, to Myra and her team for putting that together, and, and we absolutely agree with that and believe that that's something that we will commit to and Chick-fil-A will commit to, um, continuing to see how it works once it's open and it, once, once things are uh, actually selling chicken. Um, so getting right into the site plan, again, just to reiterate, I don't want to go back through everything that was mentioned, but in the existing conditions, it is a 15,000 square foot bank with remote drive throughs We are proposing a uh, 5,000 square foot restaurant. Um, parking requirement by the city is 73 spaces. We are providing 97 parking spaces. Uh, and more importantly, especially in this day and age, the drive through um, we there are five spaces are required by city code. We have the ability to stack 52 cars, um, and and not only the 52 cars, but but another important uh, note on that is there are this area up here is a, is a covered canopy, and and within that area, um, it's not just two locations for ordering. In peak times, uh, there will be staff out there, and they can have four and up to six employees that are taking or orders simultaneously that are moving it through. And then at the pickup window, um, it's not just picking up from the window. They physically have people running out to two different lines to hand, to give the food out. So the ability to turn over, um, especially in the peak times, has really come a long way. Uh, I think COVID was a factor of that, and that actually helped the, the uh, fast food industry in, in efficiency. But uh, not only is this the longest queue um, that we're doing anywhere in this area uh, from a stacking standpoint, but the ability to turn over uh, and get customers in and out faster is something that I think is, is worth noting. Um, again, just going back to there are four driveways today. We the, the two that are being removed are closer to the intersection uh, and the existing one on 43rd um, is pretty close to being directly across from where the driveway is from the school. So having the, the driveway on 43rd as far south as, as possible uh, is the best case scenario uh, for a driveway on 43rd. Um, we have met with FDOT who controls Manatee Avenue as well as Manatee County who controls 43rd and 44th. Um, and we've met with them and shared plans in the traffic study and, and they're both in support of uh, the plan obviously as with the city, we have a process to go through to get um, development approvals and uh, access approvals, but for the purposes, we've done our diligence to, to have those meetings and conversations. Uh, again, we agree with the stipulation and we're here to answer any questions. I'm gonna have uh, Michael Yates come up for a moment just to touch base on traffic and then we'll turn it over for questions. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Michael Yates with Palm Traffic. And I just wanted to kind of go through, Greg hit most of it. Again, we did meet with FDOT on the median opening that is here on Manatee Avenue. Uh, there was some discussions as to whether that should remain open or should be closed. Uh, we did a traffic study, we submitted that to the Department of Transportation as well as to Manatee County. It was part of the review that they've already done. They've reviewed the traffic study in full to make sure that that median opening would remain open because that's an important function is to have multiple access points. That's why the access to 43rd is so important and why moving it down as far south and getting away from the school access is so critical to this. We're 
Chick-fil-A is willing to commit to working with the city if there are operational issues to finding a solution. Just cutting it down to exit only, write out only, creates other problems that I think you would see as the store opened. So this was the best solution where Chick-fil-A, again, is willing to kind of work with the city. If there are problems, you know, maybe having the police officers out there and another officer down there for the Chick-fil-A driveway may be necessary during school hours. Uh, the fortunate part is during the peak hour, the, the Chick-fil-A in the morning and afternoon is outside the pickup and drop off of the school. So fortunately, their times do not coincide, they're offset, so that does help with the traffic situation. Uh, I can go into more detail, but I'll be happy to answer any traffic questions. Mrs. Barnaby. Thank you. Sir, when you did this traffic study, were you aware that Manatee High gets out about 220? Yes, we and did the counts while school was in session. While school was in session, well, okay, but but what I'm saying is just down the road from Miller Elementary is Manatee High School. Right. I have all ideas that you're going to have kids from Manatee High beat feet to get here 2.30, 3 o'clock, and Miller gets out at, what, 3.20? 3.15? I'm just wondering, did you, was all of that figured into... I mean, we just look at the peak hours. So we take the highest hours of the day. That's what's required from a traffic review standpoint. So those occur during seven to nine in the morning and then four to six. So we did not look at two o'clock for the high school, but because the road volumes outside of the high school traffic are much less during those times. So this, the Chick-fil-A volumes are less as well as the other traffic on the adjacent roadways so we looked at what is required to be looked at per the state and county requirements well i i understand that but i have i have lived in this area i have driven this area um i i mean i i understand and we've done everything we can to minimize the traffic impacts the existing bank facility from a trip generation standpoint is we're 202 trips in the daily more, but we're less in the AM peak hour and PM peak hour because of the size of the bank facility. So we're at actually a reduction in traffic during the peak periods. Well, I, I, I but I understand, I understand it's a congested area. Right. There's operational and issues we've done everything we can to try to resolve the operational issues okay. as much as we can right. and there is another business down the street from you we've heard that can much about that. at different points in time because you know we we all don't get to pick the time of the day that we go to glory that business has can have large crowds at any time of the day was that looked at Again, we did our accounts during the AM and PM peak hours. We did not go outside those peak hours because that is not traditional as part of a valuation, either required by the county, the city, or the Department of Transportation. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sure, and, and that business does schedule things around afternoon school hours that we learned early on. So. Um, which was a benefit to the business's customers. So, um, yeah, I don't, I, again, I see a lot of the, the issues there that I don't, I think we're creating a few issues and I think with putting in some of the stipulations will help solve some of those if it comes to it. Yeah, so, and that's so, why Chick-fil-A yeah. was willing to commit to right. this. And, I, and I, one thing I wanted to ask on this is, is this the typical size property Chick-fil-A buys? It's. It's a larger facility than I'm used to seeing them on. It's significantly larger. I know one of the issues and one of the things that they've been trying to do is to allow for that additional stacking. And Chick-fil-A went through and reviewed all their sites and the operation of all their sites in Manatee County. This would have by far the most stacking and would be beyond what they would ever anticipate would be needed at a facility of any of theirs in Manatee County. 
Mrs. Barnaby. I'm sorry, I had one other one other question. Sure. With its cro close proximity to the elementary school, I'm trying to see if you had pedestrian traffic, like let's say a teacher wanted to bring her class over, how would they access if, if they're walking? So they would need to come up to the intersection here where you have the signalized crosswalk and then there is a sidewalk here and then there is a pedestrian uh, path connection okay. uh, right into the store. You can see it right here. Uh, and that is required by the county and required by DOT. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Ms. Coker. Yeah, um, I was gonna say, bringing up the pedestrian, I, what I like a lot about this site plan is that the parking is, you know, you've got the parking lot and then you can go directly into the, the store because my grandchildren were here this past weekend at the other one and that, there was a dangerous incident and they ran the crosswalk and everything so i like this design and the way that you can get to this without having to put too many feet near cars and that's like what the it. larger site allowed mm -hmm. to happen and mm -hmm. when you get them to the smaller sites you get a lot more of those interactions where this site mm -hmm. is not is able to separate those interactions as much as possible all right any other questions or we'll move on to the public hearing? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. All right, we'll open the public hearing. I only have one card um, for Shelly Kratzer. Please come forward and state your name and address and you have three minutes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shelly Kratzer. I live at 603 44th Street West, right next to the proposed Chick-fil-A, which I love Chick-fil-A, like some of y'all do, um, but I'm not for it at this location because it's literally next door to my home. Um, and neither of my neighbors, I'm the only one that had this time off to come. Um, I believe Judy wrote in to state that she's both against it too. Um, some of the reasons as spoken by uh, Ms. Barnaby was, was the same thing, the traffic issue. Right now, we have Brown's Funeral Home. I live right behind it. They park on our road when it's busy. Um, the bank also, when it was open, they fly down the road. When they want to get around the 43rd Street traffic, they fly down the road. It doesn't make sense to have this location for that Chick-fil-A. Um, St. Stephen's is right across the road from Jesse P. Miller, which I haven't heard mentioned. That's another school that's right there. There's a preschool right on the corner of 9th and 43rd and 44th. That's another school that's right there. Um, the traffic study, I know you guys did your due diligence, but they're not thinking of season. I drive for a living. That's another problem come season. They're gonna have triple the traffic going out to the beach, which is you know another problem. You cannot turn right off of 44th. I try. I end up going the other way towards 9th to get off my road. It's just too much traffic. People don't want to let you out. And that right turn lane going, let me see, east on Manatee Avenue. The problem is, is when you try to turn right, you're trying to turn right into the middle lane so you get onto Manatee Avenue, you end up being forced to turn right onto 43rd instead. So that really doesn't work very well. Um, I'm trying to talk fast because I know I only have three minutes. Um, I know that the school board is not for this Chick-fil-A. I know the police are not for the Chick-fil-A because of just how much more traffic it's gonna cause. I mean, there's many other places on Manti Avenue where the old Kmart was, where the old Albertsons was. There's lots more, less traffic up there, more traffic lights, more space. I know space is an issue for that plot of land, but the traffic is an issue right there. So that is, that's the major concern. There's just no space for traffic and the schools. I mean, that's my major concern. There's children <coughs> that run right across the street from me, little kids, and they run out my road all the time. And when Browns has a big funeral, they park on my street. My, the entrance to Chick-fil-A right now, it would be literally bumped up against my driveway, and I would not be able to get out of my driveway. Um, I have no problem with them being there, but that's not gonna be a solution that can be solved, because that's the only place they could put the, you know, the entrance to it. Chick-fil-A would be, facing 44th Street 
that's a private road or not a private road, but it's, you know, a road where people live. They don't want a public building facing their road where we already have a problem with homelessness living at the Bank of America that used to be there. Um, you know, I think that you need to also think of the people that live in that area. There's children, there's families, there's a lot of other things going on there, and we already have a traffic problem. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Um, we did get one email from a person, so I don't know that would be re that's in the record. So do we don't have do we have to read it in the record? It's just in the record that obviously is who she had mentioned. A um, couple things that probably just to mention is that I don't know that the police or the school district has taken a stand against or for this at this time. So. Correct. Right. Okay. All right. Is there any other public comment? Uh, well, let's get through the public comment. Sure. Sure. Yep. All right. Thank you. Please state your name and you have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my name is Kevin Van Austin Ridge. I'm a resident of the city of Bradenton, 6902 Point West Boulevard. I have not been sworn. Okay. Tamara, can you? Do you swear or, or affirm? You raised your hand, sorry. Do you swear or affirm that the factual statements and representations which you are about to present to this board will be truthful and accurate? I do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council. Um, so I am your county commissioner for West Bradenton, and uh, when I was running for office, talking to people, some people said they were very concerned about traffic. That was probably most of them. People were concerned about water quality. And uh, I think the rest of them said, can we get a Chick-fil-A in West Bradenton? And, uh, and they like a target as well while we're at it. Um, so there, there is obviously demand for this. Uh, I appreciate the attention to detail. Chick-fil-A set down a, uh, a map there and they must have had the drone hover over that property for an hour until there were no cars on 43rd, which is in question there. Uh, but typically, <laughs> yes, <laughs> Commissioner Barnaby, or, or, uh, Councilwoman Barnaby is correct. Um, that intersection obviously is fairly congested uh, as, as it is today. Um, and that's something that we at the county have taken note of. The good news for you is that this property is located in the city of Bradenton, and so you'll be the heroes when you bring in a Chick-fil-A, and you'll receive all of the taxes from that Chick-fil-A, uh, and the county is responsible for 43rd Street, so we get the bill to re fix the road and the intersection. Um, but that is on our list. Uh, when, I, when I came in, we, our budget this year, we focused on roadways, so 75th Street and 59th Street. Are, are the top priorities. However, in next year's CIP intersections are where we're headed. Um, 75th Street and Manatee Avenue would be an example. Um, Cortez Road, we're looking at 43rd, 51st as well, and then 26th and Cortez. This Chick-fil-A would prioritize this intersection for us. Um, I've already brought it, you know, during council comments or commissioner comments, I've already brought it to our, our board and let them know that this Chick-fil-A is likely to come after it passed planning commission and that we would have to prioritize this next year. And I got, you know, it's not approved, but I got a lot of bobbing heads. So uh, that was good news. Miller offers us an opportunity uh, to expand the intersection on the south side of Manatee Avenue and that there is school board property there where we can make a deal with them. And it's not property that they would be, you know, adverse to parting with. Um, the, the idea when speaking with Public Works would be two left-hand turn lanes, a through lane, and a right-hand turn lane as well for the south side. Um, that would help tremendously. Actually, uh, Councilwoman Barnaby neglected to mention that St. Stephen's is on the other side of, the, of Manatee Avenue, and I anticipate those parents will want to come over to Chick-fil-A. Uh, and Braden and Christian is not that far away either. I was glad you brought up the Manatee kids because it, it will be a foot race, or I guess some of them have cars. Uh, so it will be a race to get to Chick-fil-A after school, I'm sure. And I'm sure Chick-fil-A is counting on that, and good on them. Um, this is a, a great location. It's a huge piece of property. Who would have ever thought that a fast food restaurant would have to queue 52 cars in order to ensure that traffic wouldn't back up into the roadway? Um, it's a comp. It's you know it's a tribute to them and, and their efficiency and you know the quality of their restaurant. Um, but obviously, we cannot you know on our board certainly we cannot punish a a business for being too successful. Uh, it is the response, it's, you know, is the use intended or not? And then it's the responsibility of the government to ensure that the infrastructure keeps up with the need and with the demand. 
And if you're wondering what your constituents want, the fact that we're so, we're cons our main concern is that so many people will go there that the infrastructure can't handle it, I think that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate it. Mr. Mayor. Can we, we'll finish public. I had a question. No question for him. Okay, yes, yes. ma'am. Commissioner, so you're, you're saying that you, not not this fiscal year, but next fiscal year, you're going to be looking at. We plan to budget it, yeah. We will not have the, the uh, intersection improved before Chick-fil-A is up and running. Okay. The reason I, I asked that is because when I sat here last time, which was a long time ago, I was told the county was going to take care of the intersection at Cortez and 43rd, and that has not had any improvement done heading south. Um, Correct. So my, my predecessor did take care of the north side uh, of 43rd and Cortez, but the south side well, actually has no. been budgeted. Well, the problem is, is again, you've got some successful businesses. You've got almost. You've got parking or driveways that are cattywampus <coughs> to each other. You have people that try to scoot across. I mean, it's, it's just sure. a problem. All I'm asking is that should this, should this council approve this, we're going to have a big headache for a while. I don't want to have a headache for a long time, Commissioner. <laughs> When we move into our intersection phase of our CIP next year, this will be a tier one project. I, I promise you that. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate it. Anyone else in the public wish to speak? Anyone wish to speak? Anyone wish to speak? All right. Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing. Council comment? Recommendation? Myra was going to. Well, I don't know if, if any questions for Myra. Did you have a response? I was just going to clarify the school board's position from um, what they sent us for the development review. <clears throat> that their concern um, was, of course, with 43rd Street, and their suggestion um, was that uh, 40 that the ingress egress only be on 44th, which we had mentioned before. Okay, thank you. Ms. Coker, did you have a, oh, I thought you read. All right, so, Chair will entertain a motion. Motion to approve SU 21.2802. Second. With the stipulations? With the stipulations. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Sanders, a second by Ms. Coker. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll start the vote in Ward 4. Yes. Five. Yes. One. Yes. Two. Against my better judgment, I'll go along with my colleagues and vote yes. And three. Yes. Thank you. Approved five to zero. All right. Moving forward, Mr. Perry. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, I have about five matters to bring under the category of, of new business, and I think it might be best if I move down to the podium try to move these along. The first matter, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council, I'd like to bring to the attention of, of Council is, uh, is as the Council is aware, we, uh, you all, approved a reorg chart, um, which brings about better alignment, efficiencies, and distribution of management responsibilities, and ultimately accountability. Um, within the, 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 the city's administration. And it's, it, in finance itself, there were several positions that were approved. One was a grants administrator, grants accountant type of person, um, and, and a budget manager as well. And I'm glad to report that after we did a, a pretty robust search, that we had some great candidates apply and be offered employment that will be starting. Um, these folks, uh, we, there, there's, there's three actually. We had a resignation of an accounting clerk and our four person accounting department, finance accounting department, went down to uh, three people. 
uh, as of about two weeks ago. And so we had to hire that position as well. Um, that being said, we were able to basically solicit and obtain qualified candidates and make hiring um, uh, rec uh, options, uh, extensions of employment. We were able to get skilled people that were degreed in accounting, CPA in one example, uh, the other individual has pretty extensive background in grant administration and accounting. Obviously, that's important for a multitude of different things regarding our grants, um, particularly in the area of American Recovery Act, the ARPA program, and we're actively involved in that as well. So that's good news across the board, and we will be fully staffed. I had uh, Don Brunner look at the possibility of doing some additional office spaces within City Hall in the finance area. He has bought in a contractor to take a look at building out some office space. That was a concern of several members of the council is do we have the space and the like. And so it's going to be a tight fit, but it's going to be possible. And I'll come back to you all with a floor plan that basically provides where those offices will be and how that will be done with an estimated cost. Um, I'm anticipating a cost probably in somewhere in the order of about twenty to, to, to $40,000. It'll involve adding an additional probably five to six office spaces. We're also bringing in um, to City Hall our purchasing department that was formerly out in Public Works, and they were in a building that was entirely unacceptable to me for, for people to, to work within. In fact, the head purchasing agent who had recently come on to the city when we looked at bringing over their furniture it was determined that her desk had termites in it that's how bad it was and yeah and, and and so you know they're coming over to city hall the good news with that is that uh, they're going to be located and mr brunner has done the most of the improvements down within the utility billing section on the first floor of city hall so the short version is we'll be able to accommodate most of this which is good news um the next matter I want to bring to the attention of council is some things I'm pretty pretty proud of, which is along with those alignments, um, we've made some some decisions and recommendations that are in your package. Um, the first recommendation is the recommendation of Chris Ball to fill the newly created role of administrative service director. And uh, as you remember through through the uh, proposed uh, org chart that I gave you, that particular department now will have a multitude of different components within it. You'll have basically um, uh, information technology, human resources, purchasing itself, utility billing, and community services and outreach. Um, I have, before I went about that recommendation, Mr. Ball and I, myself, developed a job description, which I don't think is in your package, but I want you to know that I carefully looked at what the responsibilities, um, details, and expectations were for this position as a department director. And we through, through a specific detail, we put forth what those qualifications, supervision lines, um, accountability, responsibilities, experience, knowledge, and the like, was and Mr. Bald clearly met these these expectations. Council is familiar with Mr. Bald. He's worked here at the city for I think approximately about ten years, and I think he's an excellent fit. He's already worked very closely with me in handling a number of high level administrative duties, including a great job thus far of trying to corral all of the department's needs that that may be eligible for ARPA funding, and we try to put together a matrix where we looked at the clarity of eligibility requirements so that they did fall within ARPA eligibility requirements. And that's an interesting question in and of itself because we're currently operating with this ARPA $10 million in funding under an interim rule through the federal government. I have since uh, uh, reached out to our newly enlisted um, uh, recommended government affairs legislative lobbyist person and said, could you talk with your folks and maybe give me some clarity on when we would have more specific definition on the spending um, limitations, the eligibility requirements of this funding. Because right now, it's even after we enlisted 
the contract services of Ernst & Young, they're somewhat unclear from Washington and the Congressional Federal uh, Rules Reporter of where they promulgate these kinds of rules of what we can spend this money on. Generally speaking, it's going to be um, water and sewer type projects, hard infrastructure, it's going to be broadband and IT resiliency and uh, 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 some premium pay and, and displacement types of things. But it's, it's fairly vague and I always was concerned that we may have to come back here in three or four years with something that says you didn't fit it within the eligibility requirement, therefore you're responsible for repayment of it. The answer I got after talking with our lobbyists that that contacted five people, three within the state, so a lot with uh, different uh, got local governments and their experiences, and two people in Washington was, don't expect more clarification. Because right now, there's a hubbub in Washington about overspending. There's basically two parties that are, are fighting over that, that wrangling over that type of issue. And there seems to be a lack of interest in clarifying money that was already expended. For the, for the COVID. And there also seems to be some thought about, well, maybe there's a benefit of not clarifying that. So that if things change, attitudes change, they could say, well, that wasn't eligible within what's currently there. And so it, it's kind of operating a little bit in the dark, that all being said. It was helpful to speak with our, our lobbyists about that. But that goes to Mr. Ball doing a really good job of honing things down into the eligibility requirements, looking at the priorities of the city across that spectrum, and then trying to basically um, assess the value to the city and the citizens. And he's done a great job of that, really has taken the lead. So with that, um, you know, it's my pleasure and, 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 and quite honestly my honor to put forth that letter recommending Mr. Ball for approval of the ASD director position. So do we have a motion to approve that? Move to approve. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second by Councilwoman Barnaby, okay. second by Roth for discussion. Yes, Mr. Discussion. Sanders. You said he would be in charge of HR, um, uh, utility building, um, IT. IT, and what else? Purchasing. Purchasing. It's coming over from Public Works, yes, sir. And, communi and, and community outreach services, which was a position that was approved. And, and we're going to probably be looking at, you know, developing that position conceptually over the course of the next months, probably not really bringing it online for a, another couple months after that, because it's an important position that can do a lot, but we got a lot on our plate, and, and, and we need to make sure that we define the parameters of that fairly carefully. Yeah. What is the community outreach? Is that like our... our, our uh, communications now or what, what, is what, what, what is that position is that the question yeah it, it, the position basically it, and part it's partially ARPA funded is to look, go out into the community for underserved communities in particular and try to coordinate what those communities need as it relates to potential uses of ARPA money or other federal funding we use the community block grant uh, program um, C, uh, the CBGD money and the like, but we need to really look at some of those things in our community and how we're integrating money that's already appropriated and spent by the city over a period of time with potential for new money, grants, delivery of the services, and accountability of those services. We don't do much in that regard. The county does a lot of that for us, quite frankly. And, and I think that we can do that maybe using some leverage funding fairly effectively, at least at, at a nominal level, and then perhaps scaling up from there. So that's what we're doing now with Vicki and, and part yes, of it, yeah. part v of it. Vicki's spearheading that, and, and she's spearheading it through the planning department, which is kind of an odd alignment, but so, it, it is probably where so it So how does that um, bump up against the CRA's uh, involvement with the, is it, is it, is it? There, there's absolutely interconnectability in that and, and on my board I have interoperability so that they can operate together. I think that's an excellent point that I should have, was remiss in not probably explaining. Okay. So this, that, yeah, I agree with uh, the, the um, motion in the second. I just wanted to know exactly what, yes, sir. He, he, it's almost like an a assistant administrator. Uh, <laughs> It's a, it's a department director, but I can tell you that uh, he has been helping me with some of those duties. I, I think that's a fair assessment and characterization. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Roth? Yeah, I, I um, uh, definitely all for it. Um, you know, I trust you and your uh, analysis of what's going on. I, I, I know uh, Mr. Bald really well. Is he still going to be the IT director? 
That's a great question. Um, he will not be. Um, he has um, uh, Mike that's that's there currently that he has kind of been grooming, and that was one of my questions as well. And uh, we've had some conversations about that. So Mike will be taking over direct IT. But with Chris's institutional knowledge, I can imagine he will have great influence and oversight of that department. Great. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, and Mr. Ball, of course, is present. If you have yes. any questions of him. So. Thank you. We've got a motion and a second. No further discussion. We'll start the vote. Ward 5? Yes. 1? Yes. 2? Yes. 3? Yes. 4? Yes. Approved 5 to 0. Mr. Ball, do you want to come up and say a word? Congratulations. Congratulations, obviously. No good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> Welcome to the jungle. It feels like I'm ended up in the military here somehow, but uh, um, I, first of all, I, I want to thank Mr. Perry um, and, and, of course, uh, City Council and Mayor. Um, in uh, extending the, the trust uh, in me for this position. Um, as you know, I've been your de facto CIO for uh, over, over a decade now, and in that process you learn about something called continuous improvement. It's something that sort of defines IT. So when Mr. Perry and I were discussing, you know, our philosophies on things and you know, how you evolve organizations, that's very uh, conducive and, and, and compatible with uh, the way that he thinks. Um, and I think a big part of this really is is breaking down some silos so we can be a little bit more agile. You know, I think that's the complaint that people typically have of government. It's too hard to get things done, and why do we always have to go through all these hoops and hurdles? And um, I think that's one of the big objectives that we both have is growing some internal capacities, um, being able to be more nimble, react quickly to things, um, and take some of that systems thinking and sort of apply it across the city. So. Um, again, I, I thank you for this opportunity and for your trust and um, open to any questions you may have or comments. Yes, sir, Mr. Sanders. Uh, you, you, I like the continuous improvement uh, statement you made, but hopefully you're not going to bring in Dr. Deming's theories of management, are you? Uh, we are looking at the DMAIC right now. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> there, I don't see any Six Sigma coming in or, or Baldridge Awards immediately, but the interesting thing about that is uh, that aligns what we think is good service with what our citizens think is good service. And I think that's how we get off track sometimes, is we're very comfortable with our policies and procedures, but we don't align them with who our customer is. Right. They are good theories, but they're hard to sometimes uh, uh, quantify in statistical uh, things inside of a government like this versus a manufacturing thing. Uh, agreed. Agreed. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Perry. Uh, next is, is another um, recommendation that's near and dear to my heart, and, and I think you're well aware of Ms. Melton's uh, uh, abilities. I believe that uh, she has the management skills, knowledge, training, expertise to uh, be your next city clerk formally. She's been doing that in, um, in the absence of the former city clerk, and, and it's been a pleasure working with her. It, it truly has. I mean, when I came in from the outside, you know, the new kid on the block, so to speak, I had a, I, and still have a deep, deep learning curve, and she has been instrumental, instrumental in helping me advance that and, and try to get caught up a little bit with the history, the culture. Um, I learned about Snooty yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I, and I promised her that that was oh, a snooty. very difficult yeah. subject, but, but yeah. you yeah. know, for everybody. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Yes. Dude. So it goes, it runs, yeah. that, that, that runs deep is my point with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That knowledge. And uh, so with that, you know, there is a recommendation and uh, I've had the opportunity to, to discuss it with Tamara. She seems like she's up for it. Great team player. I think she'll do a great bang up job for you. I'd like to make that motion right. to, to, for, to, uh, have Tamara Milton as a city clerk because I've worked with her now three years and uh, she's the best of the best. Second. And Second by Ms. Coachman. Any further discussion? Here none. We're going to go to the vote. Ward one? Yes. Two? Yes. Three? Yes. Four? Yes. Five? Yes. Carries unanimously. Mrs. Melton, you want to come up to the podium? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Congratulations. Just very briefly, I spoke to all of you, I believe, and, and thank you for your confidence in me. And I would like to recognize someone special in the audience today. My husband and son are here. They wanted to come and see mommy. Thank you all very much. Uh, husband and son come up first and get a picture. 
<laughs> Come up and get a picture. Chris, we would have done it, but you didn't announce anybody. <laughs> yeah. With this jacket tied around in his yeah. That's okay. He's not it's in perfect. school, so he's happy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I never thought about that. Yeah, he's not in school. But they're stopping at Chick fil A on the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Mr. Perry. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Uh, next, figure out how to do this in the best order. I guess I'll move something fairly quickly out of the way, which is the red ribbon campaign. Drug Free Manatee contacted us, and I just want you to be aware that. Uh, that the Red Ribbon um, campaign is coming up. I believe it runs on, it begins uh, on, on, I think we're 10 days away. So I wanna say the 23rd of October. And what it will be and what was requested is that drug-free manatee be allowed to put up red ribbons on the city's utility poles in the downtown area. They'll put them up themselves. They'll take them down themselves. I did speak with Public Works already, Jim McClellan, that said he didn't have a problem with it, particularly if they were responsible for both. They're, they are funded and supported by the state of Florida. The, the, the federal government, actually, actually National Drug Control and Policy out of the White House, the state of Florida, and Manatee County, which is, of course is one of our partners. So I just want you to be aware of that. I don't think it requires any official action. And if you need anything on it, I did ask them to send over some information. So I have that available if necessary. And we do a proclamation every year Thank you, supporting sir. that. So yes, sir. Great. Just a couple more items. Uh, update on sanitation, solid waste, near and dear to everybody's heart. Uh, very important to the community, perhaps one of the most important things. Uh, we are continuing to have resignations at the CDL level. Uh, Ms. Taylor and I and other folks are working very, very diligently to try to put together a uh, salary adjustment package that will address retention and recruitment. Um, I, I don't think it's any great news to people, particularly over the course of the last five days, that every time you turn on the television or, or read a newspaper article, it, they're talking about supply chain shortages, um, all the way from the port backups to the railroads to the to the truckers that, that carry the loads over the road, and ultimately everything in between. It, it's a problem across this country, and, and people know that, but at the end of the day, they still expect their, their, their trash to be picked up, and, and I get that. And we probably gonna have to take some fairly I don't want to call it drastic, but 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 significant action to adjust uh, salaries in order to um, both recruit and retain in in that area because these the, the, these resignations we're getting are appear to be directly related to that issue. Uh, you know, when you look at what we pay and the the competition that we have, not just with other solid waste entities, but about other entities, organizations, businesses that are trying to get CDLs, it's a good field to be in if you want to make 20, 23 bucks an hour, and 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 that's you know your thing, your driver basically. Um, it's not going to be a $15 an hour business anymore, at least for the, sh the foreseeable future. And if we stay at that level, trash will be impacted. And, and, and the department's done a great job trying to deal with it, both from the labor shortage perspective as well as the deployment perspective. We are going to continue to look at, at uh, improvement in that as we talk about systems improvement and quality of service and the like. It's a, it's a, a, a project that we're putting a lot, forth a lot of attention. Um, and concentration immediately. It may take a little bit time to solve it. We have hired a clean city administrator that's going to look at a whole host of uh, issues regarding solid waste, um, yard waste, community compliance, outreach, education, cost and fees, compensation, and the whole panoply of issues that kind of surrounds it. That's all I can tell you about that today. It, it's it's a difficult situation. No, no. I just wanted to, if it's yes, all right, if I jump in. Please, please, yes, I'm, I'm pretty much done. So um, we've had some weekend cleanups, volunteers, and that, and you know we've had 32 people kind of volunteer on the weekend that were staff, and 21 of them were from outside the actual solid waste department, but other staff members that were volunteering. And, and if you'll indulge me a minute, I'm going to read their names. Please, so. Um, Bert Lawton, Billy Jones, Brian Cho, 
Calvert White, Corbett Matthews, uh, Craig Keyes, which we've had two dates and um, highlight with the ones that had the, been there twice, Craig Keyes, Gabriel Horns, both twice, Garrett Falcon, James Eberstein, Jason McNeil, Jatazius Wright, Jesse Gonzalez, Jim McCollum, John Simmons, Juan Cologne, Jude Placid, Calvert Fuller, Lamont Stuckey, Lavinus Bowen, Lester Johnson, Marco Edmund, Mike Armada, volunteered both times, Ollie Anderson, Philip Campbell, Pierce Johnson, Quentin Jameson, Roberto Ramirez, both times, Scott Marciano, Stanley King, Sanile Ditta, Todd O'Donnell, Wes Silinje, it's a hard name to say, William Jones, and that's the 32 people in the city that have came out on a Saturday, and this past Saturday, um, normally, I guess in a day, we'll pick up 15 to 20 tons, if I'm not mistaken. This past Saturday, they picked up 76 tons. So to take the time and go out, and you know, even though um, 10 of them were, or excuse me, 11 of them were solid waste, the others take their time to come out on a Saturday morning and pick it up. So I did, and if I missed anybody, I'm sorry, but oh, I think Mr. you have Joe missed somebody. Yes, I you think did. you missed somebody. And <laughs> no, his no, name is Gene Brown. Nobody He's missed anybody. And Gina. Anybody. And his wife, Gina. And Brown. Gina. But, and, and, and but that shows the yeah. type of leadership we have. Our, well, the, the one of the important things to up. me, the yeah. important things to me is, as we've heard, when Jim comes up sometimes, Mr. Cho and, and Mr. Keyes tells us, you know, what you're picking up. But snakes, spiders, ants. <laughs> anything you want and again it's it was you know i felt like the little area we got wasn't much but it was to see 76 tons of yard debris was was great by our staff and what they did on a saturday to help out um, and so the citizens need to realize we're trying you know and i mean we're trying to come up administratively as well as staff wise and you know i commend all of the staff and i know mr cho you know, I'd call him and say, all right, we got another load. And he said, well, I just fixed a, a hose that blew off. I got to fix that, and then I'll be over there. So, you know, we've got all of the staff is working hard and, and appreciated. So I wanted to mention their names by their name. So thank you for what they're doing, and I hope they see this and know that this dais cares about them, and we're doing what we can to make it better. So thank you. Thank, thank, thank you for indulging me there. Absolutely, and, and uh, I, I think highlighting some of that stuff in our, our community newsletter by Ms. Roberts would be very beneficial as well, so that, that the public that would read that would understand that it isn't just uh, solid waste. It, it's everybody from the mayor to, to other folks in departments and, and everybody that's going out that we're trying to become innovative, not, if, not only picking up stuff with trash trucks, but I think you use your own personal vehicle to tow the trailer, or I saw the trailer on the, that you were hauling around and everything. That's 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 pretty good stuff so with that uh thank you mayor and, and thank you mr cho and and the public works department across the board for doing that two more quick matters uh hopefully so there was a, a, a there was a finance bar <coughs> adjustment request uh, budget adjustment request and that would have been back on september 8th uh it was budget amendment number 2140 and it was tabled, I believe, during that proceeding for some issues and concerns and questions that, that, that one of the counselors had, and, and they were very good questions. And actually, our, our categories on that particular budget amendment were not correct. We needed to add an additional category. There had to be a revenue to offset the expense, and we only had, I believe, the expense, not the revenue category. So I would request the consideration of the counselor that tabled that as a parliamentary matter to untable it to see if we can do something with, with, with that matter to finalize it. Um, I have a copy of it, it just to kind of jog people's m memories. And I don't know if it has to be amended, the original, the original. Uh, I have to undo it. 
Yeah. Yeah, I believe it has to be undone. The undone. tabling. There's a song about that. Undone. You're, <laughs> you're probably not old enough to remember. Well, we have to remember who table, who second. I did it. Yeah. Who second I don't know. We, you did, I think. All we need is a motion to pull it off the table. I, I, I have a motion. I, I would like to have to. You said a revenue adjustment on the other side. What was that? Uh, Mr. Kelly is here. Could probably just provide better detail than I can okay. on that. All right. Because I, I spoke to Mr. Kelly about that afterwards, and, and, I, and I spoke to you, so I, you know what my concern yes, was, yes, and, and that, that you've solved that. So. Morning, Tom Kelly, accounting manager. We had the uh, revenue in one fund and the expense in another, and we didn't catch on that we needed the revenue side and the expenditure side in both funds. So it was just an accounting thing that we had to correct on that with the accounts. So the, the gist of it is we're still just moving the reservoir money I, over to the capital. I, I got it. I got it. But you understand my concern. That yes, was, so, so you taking care of that. Thank you. I will. I make a. I make a motion to undo my tabling of that uh, item for a vote. Second. Thank you. Second. Mr. Roth. No. All right. So we have a motion and a second to take it off the table. And um, discussion, Mr. Roth. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, so when this came through, I was kind of surprised that it wasn't already put in a, in a uh, capital only fund, because that was when we, when we sold the property, there was much controversy about the property. Some people didn't want us to sell the property. Someone didn't like the way we were selling it. Someone didn't like who we were selling it to. And we said that we were, we were doing, it was un, unnecessary uh, fund. It was unnecessary property that was a reward. Uh, you know, that we, we're looking at a, a, a substantial amount and, and that we were going to put it in capital funds. So it never did get put in there. It should have been. So this is something that's, it's a correction. That's it was correct. At, the, at, yes, the, time, yes, at the time we bought the property, sold the property, we said this is going to be, it's not going to be in a pitter fund. It's going to go on capital yeah. outlay. It was technically in, in an unassigned fund balance in the general fund, right. which I didn't think, and I think Mr. Kelly agreed, would be better better suited and, and located in a capital fund, which is what this is doing. But, yeah, I agree. Qu question, uh, uh, you, we talked about the uh, four and three some odd thousand. I can't remember exactly. Is that something that should be addressed now or just? No, we, we won't need to address it. After I spoke with you, uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilor Sanders, I went down and talked with Tom and Linda, and they said that basically that can basically be handled just out of the capital fund itself. So that's all they really needed to do was to move this money, which is the Evers Revers Reservoir capital money, into a capital fund. But, but won't they have to come back for a vote? What will have to happen, and I think this is the second part of your question, which I have next, is in order to purchase the land acquisition, acquisition related to fire station two that's on the table, um, that can be paid for directly out of that capital fund. So it doesn't have to go from general fund to capital fund back to general fund. It can just go from general fund to capital fund and then purchased into capital. property can be purchased out of the capital fund. Okay. Yep. Thank, I just, yes, sir. No, just no, all no, it. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks. All right. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Here none. We'll start the vote in Ward 2 to table. Uh, to take, it take it off the table. table. Yes. Three? Yes. Four? Yes. Five? Yes. One? Yes. Okay. So taken off the tables approved. Do we need a motion? Is that to approve right. it going so, Mr. Sanders? I, I make a motion to approve it going forward for a vote today. And, and just, Mayor, I want to make sure, and, and perhaps Mr. Rudisil can, can help me with this, do we have to amend the original bu budget adjustment request, or is it sufficient, uh, when I ask to amend, to get both the revenue and the expense on it that has been submitted? The, origi the original one was defective. It only had the... Okay, have, is that what was distributed, an amended version of the budget yes, adjustment? Yes, sir. Okay, I think that's fine. Yeah. And that's the way we would proceed, proceed Correct. with the amended and, and that's budget adjustment BA 21-40. Yes, sir, right. as amended. As amended. As amended. We have a motion, and a, is there a second? Second. Second, second. second. all right. And then um, any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll start the vote in Ward 3. Yes. Four. Yes. Five. Yes. One. Yes. Two. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Last matter of new business, Mr. Mayor Council, is approval of the uh, the agreement to purchase the property 
uh, and land acquisition for Fire Station 2. And that is in your package, I believe. I have the fire department who is here that can talk about programmatic issues with that as it relates to locating that property, identifying it, locating it, vetting it, and, and where we're at on the transaction now. I can answer some of those questions if they come up. So it, it, I guess preference the council on questions. Yeah, the chief come up and... Good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, when uh, this property was identified, we were asked to uh, look at it and see if that would fit our needs, uh, which it does. It's a good location. It's, um, first of all, I guess you've all got it in your packet, but it's, it's located on 2229 Mantee Avenue East, which is a little further out uh, than our current station. It's, it enables us to cover the districts out on the, the far eastern point that's been annexed in. Um, and again, it's on a major thoroughfare, which makes it nice for us. Uh, so I believe it'll work out real well. Our concern when we first saw the property was that um, even though it's the width of a full city block, that it's, it's nice and wide, it's not very deep. But uh, we met with Folly Bryan and talked to them about how we could fit it on the, our station on that property. And they were good with it. They, they gave us a couple different ideas. Uh, some really nice ideas. I think it's going to be a, a really nice station, and it's going to look good, you know, in that that spot. It's a high piece of ground, which is important too for us. So, um, yeah, I think it'll. From the needs. public safety standpoint, the station that's there now has lived its life, uh, and it moving a little farther east, hopefully, will help some of our it response has. times. And and again, that's as Mr. Rolf says many times. Number one job up here is public safety. Yeah. Yeah, that building that we have them housed in right now, Station 2, is I've got a bill sitting on my desk right now for 70000 for a re-roof. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know how long this will take. We can, we, can, we can keep this building going for a little while, but that is something we're going to have to address eventually. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I, I was just... Sorry. Sure, go ahead. I, I was just curious why... It's, it's, a, it's a city block deep. Why would that not be... I mean, I was thinking you could pull it trucks around the back you can't. Right and that's in. how we would design cut, it cut so right out on manatee avenue they would I mean, come off on 22nd or 23rd yeah and you would have drive through bays in the back normally they the bays sit out on 64e so you would pull right out on that but that won't work for that you wouldn't have enough room to turn and and get it inside those uh, and are we gonna bays. as emergency mm -hmm. services are we gonna uh, be allowed cuts on um, state road 64 talking to jim he didn't think that would be um if we go east to west we'll be using 22nd and 23rd and okay. coming out on that yeah, there's two access points right. Right. there's okay. already two cuts and we also have a, a cut in the driveway to the go driveway. right if not the um not the, to the left so, right. no it's it's that was the identification of this property okay. um, after looking for years yes. i think it came and 1.2 acres more or less that's yep. a pretty good size yes. um good. i mean we, we should be able to put a a nice station on there right. yeah that would be nice yeah, I think a real nice station with obviously frontage on one of the main thoroughfares, the main thoroughfare in that corridor, east right. to west, right. you know, <coughs> down to 64 and heading east and the like. It's almost ideal um, if any property is actually ideal. The property is so unique, there's always a quirk of some sort. But this, quite honestly, there's from what I'm told, there isn't a lot of other property right. that would even come close to meeting our programmatic needs and the traffic engineering and that that medium cut that's in there that exists <coughs> currently uh you could put an emergency signal yeah. in there too which would probably be permissible with with uh dot well um and so continuing on uh, so mr perry congratulations <coughs> on getting this you know i this is this should have been done a long time ago and if we didn't act now the property the available properties are getting less 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 and less so right. i mean getting getting this done now is is monumental um, you know, this is a great, great deal. Uh, let's get moving. I think I did some quick math. So uh, the funds we just transferred, we bought this property. We still got nine million six hundred left. So yes, let's let's build this thing. Yes, sir. That sounds good. And uh, I can't take much credit. Uh, other folks, I mean, council has expressed interest in this, and the mayor's, you know, kind of prompted it along as well. So well, well, no I appreciate one would pull that. Pull the trigger up till now. Yeah, and I get that. Yes, sir. All right, do we have a motion to approve? I Mr. have a motion. I'll, yes. I'll approve it. 
or motion to approve it. <laughs> Purchase sale of the Purchase sale land agreement. Mr. The land Sanders. Agreement. All right, is there a second? Second. All right, any further discussion? I just had one question. Yes. Um, is there any kind of an appraisal contingency in here? Do you get an appraisal? I believe there was an appraisal. Was in there. Yeah, that was already done. It should have been in that package. Oh, it's already been done? Yeah, it's okay. It's already done. It's well below. Yeah, it's well below within that. Yeah. Yeah. No, and that yeah. was that was a crucial part of it. And we got we got it locked up at the right time. Yeah, we we also did environmental ones on it too. For phase ones on it. And also check for underground and uh, other types of um, uh, legal impediments, easements and the like. And the chief did mention about the the height or the of the property when you go just to the east of that property there was a a property that would have cost several hundred thousand dollars to bring in the fill yeah. and it was several hundred thousand dollars more um, configured a little differently but when you looked at it you know and and again some of the negotiations it has to be the way it is for we got it for a good price good yep all right well i appreciate it we have a motion and a second um, start the vote in Ward 4. Yes. 5. Yes. 1. Yes. 2. Yes. 3. Yes. All right. Proof 5 to 0. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Thank you guys. Thank you. Nothing further from the administration. Other than let's now let's build it. <laughs> Get it done. Next on the list. All right. Yeah. Any unfinished business, Mr. Perry? No, sir. All right. All right. And uh, council reports will start in Ward 4. Mm. Mr. Sanders? Nothing to report. All right. Five? Um, nothing to report, but I would just like to say, um, recently I had the opportunity to attend my very first Bradenton EDC uh, luncheon, and it's done annually to update and, and give the, uh, I guess, the state of the <laughs> area. Um, and it was, it was, it was very um, inspiring uh, because it looks like and, and as I listen to, you know, our new administrator and how he's bringing in people and, and we're working together, that seems to be contagious. And, and I'm just so excited to be sitting here and be a part of it. I think, Mrs. Coachman, too, what was exciting to see, you had three different types of businesses that really gave their state of their business, whether it was a local business or whether it was even local and global to where some of the situations they have in their business life is similar to what we have. So it was good to hear how they managed through some of it, especially going through the last year and a half in our country. But no, that was a, it was a great event to attend and appreciate you being there. So, Mrs. Coker? Yeah, I, w I would agree with uh, Councilwoman Coachman. And I, uh, you know, it was nice to hear what they want because we want to be, you know, we want to be answering to their needs as well but um i also had the opportunity to go to the chamber leadership retreat with several some of you else were there um and there were some ahas and um the 15th largest economy in the world is the state of florida i mean that's that's pretty pretty amazing and it sounded like uh everything's looking pretty good for us coming up so i, I was pleased to to hear that and be a part of that um I also wanted to, again, I talked about this at the workshop, which uh, Councilwoman Barnaby wasn't there, but November the 9th is the um, Veterans Day celebration for Kiwanis. And I'd like if you could just RSVP to me or uh, Bill's on Kiwanis as well, or I just would like to have a good showing of representation. And if you have any veterans in your life, it's really a, a, always a nice always a nice day and they have their speaker this year is um chief judge lee hayworth who was jag during the first war um in kuwait so um it's always a nice honoring thing for veterans my husband always um it means a lot to him <coughs> um tomorrow mama mia opens up at the theater i will be there opening night and uh you know the weather's <laughs> kind of getting nicer so we're starting to enjoy a lot of outdoor things the farmer's market i guess is back in full fling on Main Street. And uh, Village of the Arts has their um, their first Fridays, which they've had them for a while, but I'd like to see us all getting out and supporting them. And we've got the Day of the Dead celebration coming up for November 1st, so anyhow, um, lots of good stuff. 
Ms. Barnaby. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, go ahead and put me down for November the 9th. I'll be able awesome. to come. Great. Um, the only thing I would, would like to do at this point in time is remind everyone that October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. And ladies and gentlemen, because mm -hmm. gentlemen can get breast cancer, do yourself exams and make sure you have your yearly mammogram. Thank you. Mr. Roll. Um, it's nice to see uh, that it came back, uh, had a short break to see some family time up Pennsylvania, um, but it came back and found that uh, most of Ward 3 is brush free for the first time in uh, months. Uh, it's really great to see. Thank you very much. Um, now, we, now we need to try to keep it, keep caught up. I mean, it's one, it's one thing to get caught up, but the goal is to keep caught up. Yeah. And I, I do know I've been fielding some calls too, and I, under, I understand everything. And I, to be honest, I've been working with our city administrator as much as possible, trying to figure out long-term, short-term, everything we got going. But I, um, I, I do know that we have in, in, our, in our overdrive situation, there's been some times that we've missed out on the green can pickup. So we just got to keep on track of, of all this stuff, you know, uh, but the most important, the most important is the green can pickup because that's the stuff that, that starts reeking if we don't, if we miss it. So um, I just didn't want anyone to, uh, Forget that. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Ruff, I would disagree with you on one thing about reeking. <laughs> yeah. A garbage can full of grass clippings with water in it that mm -hmm. spills on your shoe and you get back in the car. That was pretty bad. So, I mean, but but that's where try, that's, try, try two weeks with a chicken. Oh, I know. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, no, just again. I, I was born everybody. and raised on a farm, so and, you know and, and I know what the, the you know the job was to, to clean the barn at before we get, we backhoes stories, and right? loaders. So you, you haven't seen nothing. A chicken farm when I was twelve. <laughs> but um, no, it's it's just an honor to be here, and, and obviously with the staff that we have, congratulations to all the new staff. Yeah. And, not new, but kind of official good positions with our transition in that. So um, welcome Jeannie back, you know, from there. And thank Myra, for, you know, got the most FaceTime today for in a long time. So appreciate that. Um, but now just thank you to everybody and uh, appreciate what we do. So let's, uh, any department heads, I'm not going to call out unless you have something come up. Okay. Robin, the singer. Um, yeah, we're going to be talking to Dover Cole to, um, uh, start that 10-year uh, report card on the form base code and so it's important that they're able to meet with all city council members um, I think since we're heading into the holiday season right now it might be waste best to wait until after the season and start that in January if you all are in agreement so I kind of just a nodding of the heads if that's the beginning yeah. of the new year is the best time to start on that unless you want to get started right away <laughs> okay all right so uh and with that in mind um we're also uh looking at some other improvements to the process and and we're starting to look at uh, permitting software uh, to kind of speed up our our building permit um, system and and uh, make that a little more robust so um, we'll probably be coming back to you with reports on that as well thank you any other department heads Seeing none, for the good of the order, we will be adjourned. Uh, 115.